Okay, I'm not entirely sure if this is going to be my morality recording that I've been talking about needing to make. I think uh, the title of this recording will be something like Sasha Baron Cohen's... I always just abbreviate his name, SBC. SBC and the Devouring Mother. I think is the uh, is the general theme of, of of this recording. Although I will get into mor morality, as uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's uh, lecture or rant or uh, speech that I, I think it was given at the ACLU, the American Civil. Uh, Civil Rights Law Union. Oh no, it's the American Civil Liberties Union. Which, I mean, you know, Civil Liberty... Uh, civil Liberties used to be an understood concept, an understood principle. Uh, and we and then we see in sharp contrast Sasha Baron Cohen's speech. I, I will give a link to the speech that I'm referring to. Um, maybe this wasn't at the ACLU, but um, he's given some. I imagine he's given some of the speeches at the ACLU. But um, yeah, so I I do see Sasha Baron Cohen's speech as exemplifying. Um, the exact crisis, the moral crisis that we are in. And it really, I mean, it, it has a lot to do in, in a Jungian psychological sense to this concept of the devouring mother. And what is in fact being devoured are normative ethics. Sasha Baron Cohen's speech is devoid of normative ethics. He basically waves them aside. He says, I know that it's hard to come up with the rules, but we just need to get this outcome. We just need to arrive at this destination and the means will justify the ends. And this, this is not good enough. We must just make sure that this is avoided. And then they pepper on, you know, the, these, these mantras and these slogans, uh, freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom of reach. And there isn't any kind of principled, systematic way of thinking about ethics to be found. We, we, what Sasha Baron, uh, Baron Cohen is giving us is, is negative tests. Um, that this is not good enough, this needs to stop. It's that kind of hysterical, moral panic, emergency, you know, just do something that's expedient that, that, that changes this outcome. And, I mean, this is how totalitarianism spreads itself, is that it gives you a moral picture. It gives you a narrative to live within. And then so, so long as, as uh, you're in that framework of reality, then... Uh, Essentially, you don't need normative ethics because you've got your moral picture instead. Now, in a civilized country with proper, let's say, Western institutions and principles and values, um, what Sasha Baron Cohen is arguing for with his inductive argument and not his deductive argument um, I believe should be illegal. What he's proposing should be against the law. The law should already make it impossible for what he is proposing to be installed. Uh, that, that, that is not to say that he is not allowed to have an opinion and to have his free speech in advocating for what he wants. I'm just saying that what he wants, what he wants to do should be aggressively denied by the law. It should be unlawful or illegal, essentially. There should be laws on the books that stop it from happening. 
and then he can argue against the, the, the structure of the law or something like that. And then we would clearly see how he is corrosively trying to undermine institutions that are functionally Western. Uh, but we don't have that kind of legal structure, at least in America, we don't. Um, uh, which again, I mean, I can be half sympathetic to. It, it, it runs on a different system, that the, the political establishment is essentially the only bulwark against totalitarianism in the American system. The legal structure itself does not empower individuals to uh, fight back against the kind of encroachment which uh, um, Sasha Baron Cohen is, is uh, advertising and, and promoting. I, I believe that, that this is not ideal, but there can be, uh, it can be said that perhaps um, the American system has got a more realistic and more pragmatic view about how to combat the ever perennial sort of uh, threat of, of tyranny is that uh, it must be politically, uh, the, the political establishment um, must be uh, pruned and uh, uh, politi uh, the people must have a kind of a, a political incentive to, to safeguard the sanctity and the integrity of the actual political appointees that, that, that represent them in their democracy. Um, Anyway, I've, I've to spoken about that issue in some other recordings um, in my critique of the American legal system, but I'll, I'll, I'll just move on fr from that topic. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure how I'm going to move on to the next sort of s set of issues. Um, So the thing is, is that when you're aiming at a moral picture, it always starts off small. It starts, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, um, because if in principle you already give up normative ethics, then the incoherence that is immediately produced is, is a bit toxic. And the only way to kind of disguise that toxicity is to advance to the point at which you are aiming at an incredibly abstract and broad and perhaps utopian moral picture to disguise your proximity to the kind of immediate cognitive dissonance and hypocrisy which is produced by um, using a moral picture instead of actual principles. Now, this moral picture, you know, uh, I, I've described it as a negative valuation of, uh, essentially, it's the definition of what is evil, or the, it is the definition of what is unjust. So it, it, it's, it's, it defines negative values that we need to stop this from happening. This is what we need to avoid. Um, The problem with these sorts of things uh, and another sort of uh, uh, component of you using a moral picture is that these negative values get translated into a kind of blanket accusation which is levied against the collective narrative that everyone is a part of. And the problem is, is that you need to find an address to have this accusation delivered at some point. It can't just stand as an ideological dictator or tenant. Because otherwise, the morality isn't being followed. How can you prove that you're actually acting on your supposed ethical system? So, you need to, at least in ritual or something like that, have some kind of scapegoating, targeting mechanism 
in which you can engage in some kind of witch hunt in order to uh, prove that your hypocrisy and your cognitive dissonance um, doesn't overcome your own uh, supposedly good intentions. And so, you know, something must be done about it. And so you end up with this combination of inflating the moral picture into a more distant and utopian narrative so that the, the symbolism of what is replacing normative values and, and normative principles becomes a very far off prospect of, 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 of a moral picture. And yet the targeting that is a, being that, that you are perpetrating in, in to advance towards that moral picture uh, becomes regulated by a very systematic, dictatorial, you know, um, system of, of sort of self-regulation to some degree, or, you know, or, or mind control. Um, And so you get this very disgusting form of rationalization, which kind of becomes this kind of pseudo intellectual secondary economy that supports their overarching ideological formula and, 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 and how the narrative um, is communed with by this particular um, sort of breed of ideologue. Yeah, and another aspect that is worth emphasizing is that these negative values are therefore anchored in, in to the extent to which that they are made realizable and real. They are only anchored by their scapegoat representation of the blanket accusation. And uh, I'll make uh, a tangent that culturally we must understand that this began with this latest version of feminism. That feminism uh, began identity politics, but uh, it doesn't even matter that it's called identity politics. Uh, we have to understand how this cascaded through the culture and, and what actually happened is that feminism dehumanized men. Uh, it dehumanized them with subjecting them to a blanket accusation and the only way that men can prove that, that they are um, virtuous according to that ideological narrative is for them to prove a negative that the blanket accusation should not be visited upon them because they are doing their part they are loosely associated in some rationalization to the progressive undoing of the uh, uh, the evil and the injustice. And that sort of got the snowball rolling and gaining momentum culturally. Because w once you've kind of got that, th then you've really got an incentive to create a socialist utopian, you know, uh, you know, you, you, once your identity and your self-esteem has been attacked and and is and is under the pressure of this blanket accusation then you have this perverse incentive to inflate that blanket accusation into the path to a a, a, a distant utopian um, moral picture so, so you have every perverse incentive to inflate the moral picture and to uh, lump in everyone who doesn't get on board with that grand vision uh, to be part of promoting the patriarchal system of oppression. And th there is another chunk to this. There is another piece of the puzzle to this, which is that obviously... Um, 
what this narrative also does is it allows people uh, or, or it allows people to believe that any deficiency in self-esteem can be extracted through the ideological narrative uh, to sort of validate their sanctimonious self-righteousness and and can sort of be an ideological supplementation of let's say properly garnered self-esteem and so within the realm of that ideological narrative within the realm of that blanket accusation which we must remember is anchored in a scapegoat so in some sense the value uh, uh, the virtue is parasitically being extracted from some kind of identity scapegoat or some kind of representation of that identity scapegoat and it is fueling the self-esteem and the self-image uh, via the, the belief that the ideological narrative is canonical, is, is, is uh, the truth. And the problem with this is that it's an abstract form of self-esteem. It doesn't actually arrive at the person who believes in this stuff. It, it, it doesn't get delivered to them. And so they still have no self-confidence. They just gain an argument against somebody else, a morally charged, emotional sort of form of, of uh, um, what I would regard as, as very close to a kind of borderline personality disordered codependency on their scapegoat. Um, And I, I need to, to expand on that when I talk about the devouring mother. Um, but I'll just put that to a side. Uh, so we have blanket accusations. Uh, that creates a necessity to prove a negative against the blanket accusation. Why does the blanket accusation not apply to you? And this is the problem is that you cannot prove a negative. It's not possible. No one can. And so because no one can prove a negative and yet you must prove a negative within this moral paradigm, um, this new morality, you have to supplement proving the negative with a kind of radical adherence to dicta that supposedly ground the symbolism of the moral picture which is being rendered progressively or something like that. And what's interesting as well is that everything is always seen from the lofty perch of this sort of utopian possibility that everything is contrasted. Uh, against. And this has characterized left of, uh, leftist thinking for a long time. I mean, I would, I think this is what, why Marx criticized many utopian communists as being stupid, is because they had this. But then the same thing essentially um, was incubated within so-called Marxism. So, um, Anyway, I, 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 I don't want to uh, go down that rabbit hole, but um, okay, so let me reground myself. So, so you have uh, a narrative. Uh, that has a blanket accusation, and that blanket accusation will essentially always produce, let's say, a shadow of hypocrisy, of double standards, of incoherence. And therefore, there is a perverse incentive to elevate 
the narrative to an even loftier and even sort of more vague and distant utopian sort of uh, uh, spiritual almost um, na to, 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 to create a kind of a, a cosmic, you know, um, a more abstract picture, as it were. So that uh, to, to try and, and, and offer support to the more prox uh, proximate uh, sort of uncomfortableness of, of hypocrisy, uh, which is essentially inescapable when you are trying to prove a negative. Um, now, I, I, I think that this, this, this formula of using a moral picture to begin with that uh, comes from essentially associating all your moral thinking with, with in principle, the negation of normative ethics and normative principles because instead of grounding it in let's say some kind of sort of Kantian formula and thinking things through from first principles um, what you instead do is you say this is the outcome that we cannot endure we we cannot have this um, and then you have to kind of liken other bad things to that. And, and uh, sorry, I've just slightly lost my place. But anyway, um, the inflation, the lofty inflation of the, of the grand narrative of the moral picture is also, in a sense, needed to... Um, double down, to have the space to double down to escape one's own hypocrisy in needing to prove a negative um, and, and incoherence. That you end up having to almost mystify yourself in a whole set of rationalized, associated, sort of logical semantics and sophistry uh, and so you can always find some excuse on the one side or, or you know, somewhere within your, your, your system of, of loose associated rationalizations to justify what you're doing proximately in, in one niche. So... You know, and, and, and this is how totalitarian sort of ideologies uh, uh, are needed. They become essentially uh, like a mythological worldview, um, all under the umbrella of, of some broad guiding, uh, uh, the broad guidance from this, you know, sort of distant and remote moral picture uh, that is being marched towards. Um, And in some sense, you know, I mean, j just looking at it from sort of the cultural, ontological ground zero from the feminism that I described, in some sense, that inflation of the narrative, you could even say, you know, a feminist, I can imagine a feminist having the sentiment that, you know, well, if we don't do this, th then we really have to think that there's something fundamentally wrong with men if we don't sort of make it into a broader and more abstract and more sort of formulaic worldview. Um, because we need to give something more for men to, to come with us to double down into in order to, to um, correct a more systemic blanket accusation. So that in the fulfillment of the systemic uh, 
upgrade, uh, we are all ascending to some kind of higher puritanical virtue. Um, or, I mean, I mean, I, I say that, but I mean, that's also, I mean, obviously, feminists will be a whole mixed bag. Um, and essentially, uh, there is also a psychological need to extract almost through a kind of vampirism, parasitically, um, some form of value from a scapegoat. And if you don't sort of attach yourself codependently to a targeted scapegoat, it's going to be very hard to sort of sustain uh, this program of this moral m marching forward. You know, it, 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 it has to be fueled by the blood of the of the scapegoat uh, as the source of the value and the energy because if if you don't have the scapegoating and the witch hunts then there's no um there's no proof that your impetus is being vindicated um if people don't allow you to engage in that kind of um conspicuous vampirism in order so, so, so that value can be redistributed and delivered to someone's self-esteem which is you know ironically not even receiving the self-esteem they're instead getting this kind of ideological identitarian self-esteem so that their identity is getting stronger while the other person's identity is getting weaker but on the ground uh, almost de facto there's almost a, a kind of a strange kind of inverse alchemy to to the ideological narrative where everything is just functioning on a lower state on a on a on a more destabilized um ad hoc authoritarian you know sort of uh centralization and mediation uh that that arbitrates over everything that somehow life outcomes must be uh directly apportioned by some commissar of the moral picture and you know so there is this always this this uh, uh, drive towards uh, creating institutions that project this moral authority over society that are fulfilling this moral picture and instead of actually um, working with any kind of normative ethics or, or any in any kind of principled way because the moral picture is is the supplementation of principles it becomes the the new speak of what a principle is um, And then, you know, essentially at the end of the day, what everyone is sort of left with is the virtue signaling in some sense or the hollow pontification of people that more, uh, more easily manage to um, bask in the glow of the moral picture or something like that, that become sort of avatars of the moral picture. Uh, which ironically, you know, sort of fall on the shoulders of oligarchs um, and people who have this kind of this cosmic luck to uh, there's this weird kind of magical fatalism within this kind of totalitarian narrative, you know, in which the, the, the nomenclatura all, all have this kind of uh, the, this natural uh, role of being the vanguard, 
and the keepers of this new sort of moral animal, uh, which is, I would say, premised in, in, a, in a form of dehumanization uh, that has been doubled down into a... Um, quite a grotesque sort of hydralist, but um, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that they do always hypocritically devalue their own moral picture because it's not possible to coherently represent it. And so the double standards can only be excused by radical adherence uh, to some kind of pageantry, to some kind of virtue signaling, and essentially joining the mob for some kind of uh, witch, ritualistic witch hunt and scapegoating. And, and, you know, we see this in contemporary culture, um, I think Twitter, to a large extent, is, is, is what this is used for. Um, and, I mean, what, what we're witnessing is really just the toxicity of what non-normative morality looks like. Um, and it manifests as cultural totalitarianism. Now, the, the jump that I'm trying to get people to see is that, you know, if you watch Sasha Baron Cohen's speech, that is the intellectual uh, source code of this uh, cultural totalitarianism. And uh, people need to start making that correlation. They, they need to start seeing that. Uh, otherwise, we, we are going to get into more and more trouble. We're going to have to deal with um, a population which, I, I mean, I think that these sorts of people are real problems for generations to come. They will, if they have children, their children will likely develop with overt fascist sentiments, uh, political consciousnesses, um, because they, or they already categorize uh, and conceptualize society exactly like the fascists did. Um, you know, identity politics is philosophically indistinguishable from fascism. Hitler would have called these people useful idiots. Um, I, I just call them proto-fascist because uh, they force a kind of destabilization and they force a kind of disintegration of any kind of functioning uh, uh, principled system and then they almost wipe, they scrub uh, uh, society uh, clean of anything that is capable of resisting fascism because their morality is the antithesis of, of normative ethics. They don't want a common society. They want something like a separate but equal identitarian power-sharing thing. So they think that you can kind of have a rainbow Hitler or something like that. But, um, you know, this is why Hitler would have called them useful idiots because obviously a government can only ever serve one identity. And so, you know, at some point, and this is already happens within identity politics, is there is this move towards segregation because they cannot avoid the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the feelings of unsafety in terms of people's narratives being challenged, the, their bubbles being popped, their, um, you know, their internal, let's say, economy of feeding self-esteem their beleaguered identity um, is such a, a fracture is, is such a divisive uh, um, mechanism of, of internal you know it, it, it's uh, it, it, it's so psychologically dysfunctional and pathological that is essentially you you have to kind of 
try to avoid people interacting with people from different identitarian groups as much as possible because um, they represent uh, either that the blanket accusation has not been um, paid for by the requisite sort of collective guilt or, or representation of a collective guilt uh, and so, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I mean, it, it, it's, it's hard to even track all the lines of, of the loose associative rationalizations that are applied, but essentially it just makes everything so unwieldy. It makes, because essentially you, you have replaced normative principles, so you've made it impossible for people to actually get along with one another for people to recognize each other's humanity. It's not possible under this moral picture. Um, yeah, I, I didn't... It's weird, because I'm not talking about Sasha Barra Cohen's uh, actual thesis directly, but let, let me talk about it. So he's, con he's complaining about people on Facebook that are propagating con conspiracy theories. And, and that are denying the Holocaust. That, that's the big one for him. That, that people argue that the Holocaust didn't happen. And we, we cannot let this anti-factual sort of conspiracy spread. And, and because it might take over. Or something like that. Um, I, I think that this whole concern is frankly disingenuous. Um, I think conspiracy theories are a healthy part of uh, public discourse, as it were. They're a healthy part of free speech, and, and I think that we can say that conspiracy theories are on the rise. And I think that we should seriously answer the question, why are conspiracy theories um, g gaining more traction within, within the population? Is it because that our ordinary institutional gatekeeping sort of media figures have lost control and why have they lost control perhaps because they have lost trust with people and maybe it is that they do not deserve trust and maybe one of the byproducts of of when you have uh, uh, journalism when you have your your sense making organ in society that is meant to be telling people what's going on, when that has lost trust, then maybe what a byproduct, a natural byproduct, is that you get a proliferation of conspiracy theories. And maybe that is a symptom of, well, somebody else should come in here and argue against these conspiracy, conspiracy theories, because they don't trust the talking heads on the news. So maybe a new intellectual elite, maybe a new journalistic class needs to come in here and, and clean up these conspiracy theories and argue against them and prove their chops and knock down the dominoes, which cannot be knocked down by the people that, that no one trusts. And perhaps they don't trust them for very good reason. So perhaps conspiracy theories are a natural part of public discourse that are that is in fact part of the solution to creating a new cultural edifice, a new cultural consensus, a new sense-making apparatus that people can trust. Maybe it's part of that process. But you don't, you don't get to understand things organically. You don't get to be uh, um, you know, a natural participant of a society when you are lording over the society and you're looking down at it and you're sneering at it from some kind of abstract narrative, from some kind of moral picture and judging it as being, well, you know, yes, uh, uh, obviously um, social media has displaced uh, uh, CNN and whatever news you get on the television, and therefore we need to nip this in the bud. We need to make sure that freedom of speech does not mean freedom of reach. How regressive. How dysutopian. How... I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, I mean, so I, I'll just say I've provided an alternative narrative to Sasha Baron Cohen's whinging and complaining, which very conveniently uh, uh, 
empowers him to suggest these expedient, uh, censorious measures from, from our Orwellian overlords and oligarchs to step in and to nanny us. Uh, you know, it's, um, this is what happens when you give up principles and normative ethics. You can't see the wood from the trees anymore. Uh, you've just got your sort of, your program of, of loose rationalization and associative thinking, which inductively, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, as they say. Um, I do think that maybe the, the freedom of speech, freedom of reach thing, that also needs to be tackled as, as an independent, you know, sort of, um, that, that's a disgusting sentiment. I mean, it really is. The idea that um, people need to have their information pre-selected for them and that they cannot curate their own information and that... Uh, some kind of automatic filtration system n needs to happen. I mean, this is dangerous stuff. This is Orwellian stuff. Um, and you think because you've come up with a clever little rhyme, freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. Look, I mean, the arguments about limbic hijacks and, you know, the race to the bottom of the brainstem. Uh, I don't think that these things are necessarily unhealthy. Uh, I think that these are patterns which, if you're concerned about them, you should talk about them within the realm of, of public discourse. Uh, and, and, and perhaps you should try to educate people about these things. Uh, but the idea that you need to prevent it from happening rather than inf allowing people to make informed choices, um, I think is also a dangerous thing because I would like to get to the bottom of these things. I, I would like a culture uh, that can be resilient to these kinds of forces. And the idea that people's psychologies needs to be pre-selectively tailored and engineered and that we need socially engineered outcomes and sort of population management on the idea of uh, on the line of thought control is it is inappropriate it's not only inappropriate for for a republic uh, uh, that has a, a democratic system um, of appointing its representatives um, You know, you are, have already in principle sort of uh, taken something like the concept of public health and uh, turned it into something that can be uh, captured by a partisan agenda and an ideological um, vision of essentially pegging... Uh, um, morality at, at, a, at a certain contemplative uh, uh, level in which you are trying to prevent actual synthesis from occurring within public discourse because you're, you're trying to control it on the level of, of top-down sort of uh, uh, editorialized narrative. I would say that, that this is a, I mean, this is what happens when uh, 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 people's 
I, I don't know what to call it, the, um, the, the platforms, the platforms for, for the public square, the platforms that essentially um, facilitate the modern day public square uh, are infused with this kind of blanket accusation, moral pictures and things like that. And, and this does make them toxic. They are fundamentally um, antithetical to, to the West. We have to recognize that these people are, um, they are a different kind of, of um, creature to uh, the Western system of uh, civil liberties. I mean, they've even somehow managed to make an organization that has civil liberties in its, in its name. Uh, they've managed to transform that into the antithesis of, of civil liberties. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite astounding when you think about it. I mean, that, imagine the kind of semantic, you know, sort of, gerrymandering and the kind of, uh, you know, just the purely unscrupulous you know, uh, uh, vision of being able to assert a new truth, a new doublespeak, um, that you can just kind of cover yourself by redefining words, what is violence, you know, um, what is safety, so that you can hijack moral language, so that you can redefine racism, uh, so that e everyone who isn't racist in your very strange sort of cult uh, becomes a racist. Now, I, I said I wasn't going going to go down the rabbit hole of the American legal system, but I am just going to touch on that. Um, so the thing that I don't like about the American legal system is that um, you cannot go to court and defend your culture and your, let's say, your Western values against identity politics at the end of the day. And that, I think, is a real shame. Now, you might be able to in the future in America, if they kind of get on top of this and the legislature wakes up and, and works out how to maybe put normative principles into the law as a kind of, uh, but that again will only be there because the legislature placed it there. I do think that part of the fight back is for cultural movements to spring up uh, and, and to codify essentially principles and say, our company and me as an individual believe in these principles and these are how we operate and use that as a bulwark against identity politics. I, I, I think that is going to be necessary at some point uh, to win back the culture. But anyway, um, you know, that essentially you need to be able to have such a thing as fair discrimination, that fair discrimination is valid and is okay. And it's not, it's not the same thing as discrimination in the ugly sense, or it's not being prejudiced. That you can prejudice the interests of a group, and it is correct to do so, it is fair to do so. This is what the word phobia is trying to essentially hijack. The idea is that, well, if you hurt the interests of a group of people, like abstractly, that, that means that you hate them, or something like that. Never mind that there's actually a good reason why you don't want to have uh, uh, people going to other people's bathrooms or something like that. Never mind investigating the actual merits. It, it, no, you're just phobic or if you don't already get behind uh, promoting the interests of some group somehow we're going to loosely associate your phobia with, you know, what happens in other countries when people get killed for being different. Somehow, because you're phobic, that all gets conflated somehow. You know, it, it's that kind of crazy, loose associative logic. Um, so, 
the 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 legal problem in America is that essentially the culture of values is not defended independently by the legal system. It's essentially defended by the legislature and then the, the judiciary has to uh, keep up uh, or upkeep and, and, um, co and conserve and enforce the law that was made by the legislature. So whenever you're in a court case and one side wins over the other side because of, uh, uh, let, let's just say if, if a social justice warrior, if an, I, if an adherent of identity politics goes to court and they don't get their way, what they are hearing from the judge is you don't have power over the legislature yet. Come back when you take control and then I'll rule in your favor. That is my problem with the American legal system, is that your fight for moral authority is over the, 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 the political, there's no independent force of, of moral authority which you can extract from legal concepts. The legal concepts are all there essentially just to reinforce either uh, the framers of the constitution or the legislature. And I'm just going to say conceptually, I'm going to lump in the framers of the Constitution with because essentially they are like the the parents of all the legislature. So it's it's, it's just one um, they kind of fall into that section within the separation. Although that framework does define and delineate uh, the separation of powers itself. But anyway, um, this is a real problem. And the, the constitutional rights in the Bill of Rights are very bad because they, they are effectively, they stand as much, uh, I've, I've made this argument in other recordings, I, I, I don't want to rehash this stuff, but essentially the, the problem is, is that um, they are always interpreted in favor of the legislature they're not they're not interpreted um they don't have an independent meaning they they are always rationalized to be sort of in line with uh the the power of the state so in some sense the judiciary is sort of is not on the side of the citizen um they're on the side of the legislature uh that needs to be stated a bit more carefully than I just stated it, but I'm just going to say that that is roughly what happens. Um, and so your constitutional rights get reinterpreted in line with essentially that de facto moral authority that is vested in the legislature. And this is, I, I would consider this dangerous. I would con consider a better principle, uh, I mean, uh, a, a better legal structure would be that if the legal system actually has independent principles um, that are substantive, that, that, that elaborate into substantive criteria for things and, and have their own system of legal concepts. I mean, I, I, I think I was even out loud, uh, outlining in my, in my recording talking about um, the American legal system that, I mean, especially with this voting thing uh, at, at the moment w w with, with Trump, I think that um, with the recounts and things like that, that it is essentially irrational, but also more importantly, it's unreasonable that people's individual votes should be threatened by nullification from voter fraud just because the legislature has deigned to create criteria that is so lax and so irresponsible. And because essentially the legislature gains its authority from uh, the integrity of the voting system, that if that, that if that integrity falls below a certain 
unreasonable threshold that cannot just be um, they cannot be the uh, uh, the judge in their own case. The legislature cannot just blithely make whatever criteria they so wish to um, to underpin the legitimacy of their own um, appointments. You know, uh, uh, it's um, that I would argue that. Um, At some point, there has to be a superseding um, consideration that is independently uh, derived out of the need to operate from principle and not just dicta that is defined uh, or described by the legislature itself that um, you know th that in some sense the legislature has threatened its own legitimacy to such a severe um, extent uh, that it it's it's uh, um, dicta cannot be respected um, and some general principle of, of reasonableness needs be applied against them by the judiciary. Uh, now, th this would unsettle... Um, yeah, in some sense, I think that, that it's, it's paradoxical, because I think that such an ovation within the American legal system is necessary in order to even entrench a meaningful separation of powers. Um, And I mean, this argument is slightly esoteric, but essentially the judiciary cannot merely facilitate um, the will of the legislature when it falls below a certain threshold of acceptability. Um, Because uh, when such acceptability would uh, call into question and challenge the legitimacy of the, well, I mean, in this case, the uh, um, the composition of the, of of uh, of who the body is 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 appointed by, um, the composition of who is appointed to that body um, as representative. Uh, as due and valid re representatives. But, um, yeah, okay, this is uh, getting strained slightly. But, um, that in principle checks and balances don't mean anything um, if they are merely sort of iterated dicta, but that they actually have to conform to uh, a coherent system that is, you know, reasonable in its um, in its operation. Um, and so it's it's not merely enough that. Uh, certain relative dicta in, in founding documents or, or legislative documents 
are fulfilled as per uh, but essentially when the effect of, of these things um, creates an almost existential self-contradiction uh, a kind of untenable hypocrisy um, but uh, but in a fundamental um, resulting in a kind of fundamental self-defeating um, devaluation as, as something that is so uh, necessary as um, legitimacy uh, Anyway, yeah, I've articulated this very, very badly, but um, anyway, this is the problem when the law doesn't independently have of itself substantive criteria and legal concepts that cannot merely be um, that have an independent constitution and, and conceptualization that cannot merely be amended by a legislature. And this is, in some sense, I think, why um, this kind of cultural totalitarianism is so frightening is because if it does gain dominance over the legislature, the system is effectively capable of being completely uh, dissolved. Because uh, the Bill of Rights has never been um, useful against the legislature. I mean, you know, even famously, um, and I, I believe that they are roughly correct, that the, the you know, if you, if you really have a constitutional issue, you know, you're talking about 10 years down the line, and it's only, it's probably not even going to be decided in your favor, unless it looks like that the legislature was about to be on your side anyway. Um, So you've got essentially a constitution which is largely non-justiciable. It, it's not uh, uh, it's not a readily apparent and useful defense against tyranny. Um, and as I've said before, I'm slightly sympathetic because then essentially the defense that it offers is of a kind of is is of a kind of politically. It's, it's a form of sort of political propaganda which can be used to beat against, you know, certain forms of, of overt political um, campaigns and messages that, that uh, don't conform to the spirit of it. But, you know, it's almost like a spiritual... Um, list of sentiments than it is uh, a justiciable source of rights. Um, again, I mean, th this means that people need to think very carefully um, about the the ideologies and, and the politics of the people that, that they choose to represent them. Um, and it forces, you know, a kind of perhaps a, a very hot contest 
on who gets elected when, let's say, uh, the general society's consensus on values, on political values, uh, gets fractured. Um, obviously, these sort of things are sort of non-issues when the health of culture is uh, a lot more robust, as it were. But anyway, um, okay, I'm, I'm really waffling about this stuff now, but... Um, I think the worst thing about these identity politics people is that, in some sense, they know this. They they know the political game that they are playing. They know the system that they're in, and they know that when a judge doesn't let them get their way, the judge isn't saying that there's a fundamental legal obstacle for you. The fundamental legal obstacle is is merely the lack of the requisite political control needed to make the de to change the form of law to make the decision go the other way i consider that a failing of a legal system but my country that actually has what i would considered to be a superior legal system isn't doing much better but that is merely because um, judicial appointments are decided on by the political establishment and the political establishment is deeply corrupt and uh, using identity politics in order to justify um, its uh, uh, political unaccountability um, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, you know, identity politics is basically a gift to, to any kind of pl pl plutocracy anywhere in the world. It allows elites a huge amount of freedom because all they have to do is virtue signal and then they can get away with whatever they want. And they can also divert the, the political tension and blame onto the identity politics scapegoat. So it's this, it's this never ending, um, sort of cycle of political unaccountability. Um, and so it's important that uh, this new moral fad uh, of these of using these moral pictures to corrupt the law, which is what I would consider to be the Napoleonic corruption of law, which uh, is definitely the Napoleonic corruption of law in my country, because my country was actually the only legal system that didn't have a Napoleonic structure in its legal system. But people think that it does now because they are essentially goose-stepping with everybody else's legal system that already had this kind of Napoleonic defect in it, which is, uh, I roughly describe that when you have a society in which morality is arbitrated over or, uh, and in, is enforced in a public way through the legislature instead of through the independence of the judiciary then you've got the napoleonic corruption when essentially you appoint people to legislate morality over you instead of going to court to fight for your morality in, in, a, in an independent uh, setting with independent, independent substantive um, criteria and uh, concepts and 
this is addendum to my last recording. I'll probably just adjoin it to the same uh, upload. So the, the aspect that I didn't elaborate uh, was the aspect of the devouring mother. Um, so I just think, um, matter-of-factly, there is a historical uh, correlation here between feminism and the kind of uh, cultural totalitarianism that has now gripped society, which I will say is, is part of this general theme of the displacement of normative values and principles. And just historically speaking, I, I think we just have to recognize that this came from this latest variant of feminism. Feminism started off by dehumanizing men and replacing individual accountability and individual integrity and dignity with essentially a matrix of blanket accusations. A reality, a worldview in which there are blanket accusations that some people are representative of systemic oppression and other people have their identities trampled on and therefore have no access to a self-esteem which is meant to be provided by their identity. That's meant to sort of, they just meant to sort of inherit this. It's just supposed to be inbuilt in the social structure somehow. And so when you've got that kind of worldview, it's very easy to kind of just rest on that, uh, on those sort of uh, very all-encompassing and far-reaching ideological themes, which you can always use to provide self-esteem to people um, merely by uh, professing the validity and the predominance of of that ideological narrative. So essentially, as long as you can force other people to believe that narrative, you can cram it down their throats, you can force them to comply with it, um, or you can just kind of mention it um, and constantly, you know, sort of invoke it uh, sort of implicitly uh, um, relying on it on, on somehow that it, that it sort of deserves a kind of orthodoxy it, it deserves a kind of dogmatic um, compliance with uh, you can sort of keep on using that to supplement your self-esteem because by projecting this issue onto someone and by forcing them to to um, uh, to to bend the knee um, and conform with it, uh, you can imagine that you're part of some magical process that that is uh, destroying social injustice. You know, as as vague a term that is. Um, that you're progressively sort of bringing about this moral picture, which has, you know, no substantive principles that hasn't been argued from first principles that, you know, isn't based on objective criteria other than that the ends justify the means. That's their only criteria. And then they've got this sort of this vague utopian uh, uh, idea that all identities will be equal on all metrics or something like that, so, something stupid and crazy. Um, and so this kind of this natural investment that the only thing that you can trust is how your identity is treated. And that is the metric by which you can interface with society in which you can have any kind of supposed integrity or self-esteem. And so because you've got this ideological confidence in your identity that displaces having to navigate life as an individual and having to... Um, uh, be responsible for your own destinations and being responsible for curating your own knowledge and understanding of things and working out who and what you can trust and learning how to actually do things on a practical level. That's all displaced by, well, the, the system doesn't already give your identity an equal sort of ray of light or something like that it, it doesn't give you an equal standing or, or something like that so you can just always lean into essentially making comparisons between people 
and you can just cherry pick your way into um, finding some scapegoat to compensate you for the systemic oppression in inverted commas. And that becomes a one-size-fits-all solution to everything. Um, and you never have to deal with the underlying issues. You never have to confront the real practical challenges. Um, they can all be essentially superseded by that strange polemic that is, uh, as again, it, it, it's toxic to normative principles. Um, and it does displace normative values and principles. Okay, so feminism got the ball rolling, and now it's sort of, you know, uh, accumulated, uh, what's it called, uh, you know, the, the, the snowball has, has gained uh, momentum and size as it's been rolling down this hill. Um, but it is worth it to actually know that culturally this is where it started, because you can... I think I, I explored it in the last recording that, you know, perhaps even feminists wanted to broaden the issues and get to a kind of, you know, a kind of utopian socialism or something like that, because then they don't have to keep on proving the point that, you know, it's men that are oppressing woman that suddenly it becomes you know these these broader and vaguer things like capitalism uh, and essentially is it anything that isn't directly regulated by this kind of this moral picture of of moving and marching towards this uh You know, something that doesn't help to eradicate the moral picture that defines, you know, what is evil, what is injustice, uh, and, and what isn't helping to cut that out. Because essentially, anyway, I, I went into that stuff about the blanket accusation, but... Um, and so... I guess the the more convoluted and confusing it gets with the blanket accusation, the more cultural need there is to prove the negative that you're not part of the bad element, that you're not um, helping in social injustice, and that you're not a part of the evilness, and you're instead part of of sorting it out. And so. Uh, I, I did also discuss this in the last recording that there is this perverse incentive to kind of um, radicalize and to try to formalize some kind of dicta because if you don't sort of fudge a program of some kind of thumb sucked dicta that just kind of orientates you um, in terms of providing for guidance as to what you must do in order to comply with the overarching narrative you know sort of march towards progress towards the moral picture um that eradicates the uh, um the moral evil these sorts of themes i'm going to tie them to the devouring mother which i think is There is something that is associated with femininity, um, which I think we must also understand why ancient cultures were misogynistic. Uh, even the Greeks, um, for all their philosophy, uh, were in societies that, that were deeply mis misogynistic. And I, I do think that there is a base element in the differences between men and women, which, um, which we have to respect and which we have to come to understand. And we have to grow the maturity to, and the nuance to, to, to grapple with. And 
essentially men and men and women are very much the same but that doesn't mean that there aren't differences and just because they can both enjoy the good life uh, in the same way doesn't mean that they both have the same obstacles and impediments uh, in achieving the good life. And I mean, I can just point this out on a psychological level even, that we know for a fact that women have much higher rates of borderline personality disorder and men have much higher rates of narcissistic personality disorder. So, you know, we know that, that we have, and, and these different psychological profiles uh, don't just manifest in terms of particularly disordered people uh, that have those particular personality disorders. They also manifest as general features, let's just say. And now, obviously, I'm talking in, in generalizations. And generalizations should never be used to castigate or to be held against an individual. Um, you know, it that's would always be morally defective to hold general features of a group that can be generally imputed to a group to hold an individual to to account for that. It, it makes no sense. Um, you know that that's uh, unfair and sloppy. Uh, But when we talk about femininity, we're talking about a cultural construct uh, which does have its basis in biology, which does have its basis in, let's say, psychology as a generalization of an entire biological sex. Um, and as much as femininity is, it, is itself a construct which falls under the category of a generalization, that doesn't mean that it, it doesn't uh, have significance and importance, which uh, it, it needs to be examined, as it were, its contents. Um, and as I say, I think it needs to be grappled with. Um, and, and we need to see uh, what's actually going on. I mean... In terms of femininity, um, and in terms of the differences between the sexes, I would say that the, the major differences between the sexes um, is what I've already called in other recordings as the opportunistic sexual strategies. Men and women will have different forms of opportunism that they will try to enact within a culture and, and i and i'm taking this because i think that that generally if you frame it like that and you can understand it in almost a kind of evolutionarily psychological sort of uh, um, framework that obviously we're, we're going to develop um, different uh, strategies which maximize the um Uh, you know, I mean, the advantage uh, or, or, or the potential advantage of, of being um, a genetically successful propagator of one's genes. Um, that's going to look different for men and women. And so why wouldn't this lead to um, some manifestation of uh, a difference in psychology, or generally speaking. I mean, wh wh why wouldn't it? Um, so anyway, I, I, I'm just trying to outline that there is, that, that there's obviously going to be very real differences between men and women in terms of um, their psychology, and, and we should confront this. And that this is not to say that um, men are inferior to women or women are inferior to men is, is just to say that they they have differences. They, they have more similarities than they have differences, but there are also differences. And so it's interesting as well that when 
the ancient civilizations were misogynistic and they and they held women in such low regard this was usually a way to exclude women from politics you know th that women were famously um excluded from the kind of democracy that was developed uh in the athenian city-states or the um uh, uh, in, 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 or, and, and the other sort of um, political life. I mean, e even in, in Roman society, which, um, which individual women um, could hold tremendous power in terms of their um, influence over men, um, was much the same, that, that legally women had uh, no standing, but de facto they still had uh, quite great influence. Um, this is a, a, a conundrum that needs to be taken seriously. It's something that can't, you can't just kind of generalize this into women were oppressed. Um, we have to look a bit deeper and see what was actually going on in these societies. I do believe, to a large extent, women were scorned in the way that they were in order to limit uh, women's influence to certain cultural spheres of attitude and discourse. I think women, even in those times, determined the sentiments within society to quite a high level um, that the general mood of I mean you know, this is I, I mean even even in the the old misogynists uh, you know uh, Cato the elder for instance um, was always on on uh on guard for how if you allowed women to to di dictate sort of certain levels of of indulgence uh uh as a as a as a kind of cultural fad that they would end up expending vast resources in trying to compete with each other for social status using uh, you know, that fad or something like that. And it would essentially, it would go to no productive purpose, but essentially um, it would in some sense uh, be a corruption of public morality that essentially the, the actual, the form in which public morality expresses itself, uh, that women like exploring these, these avenues and topics as providing them with very tangible and symbolic ways to uh, explore social standing and security within their society um, okay I've, I've sort of overextended myself slightly um, again talking in these kinds of uh, generalities but um Let me see how I can approach this topic. Uh, 
Yeah, I guess I, I can't even talk about this topic without first describing what's going on with a borderline personality disordered person. So, uh, what I have to say about borderline personality disorder is, is probably controversial. Um, but I think that, that my interpretation is uh, just as valid and possibly much more substantial than the other, complete, uh, the other competing interpretations. Um, what I believe is going on in borderline personality disorder is essentially a form of psychopathy. It's no different uh, from male psychopathy. It's just being perpetrated through a much more sophisticated strategy. And uh, because that strategy has to conceal its own psychopathy, it ends up having to create a distorted vision of reality and also society and social conventions. It ends up creating um, uh, so, sort of two things simultaneously, but it's kind of like one thing or the other thing, or it's kind of conjoined. They, they end up creating sort of delusional beliefs about themselves, about their own identity, and naive reductions of how society functions and, and, and the conventions of society. And I think that, that both of these models are both acts of willful bad faith, that, that the borderline's reported, self-reported vision of themselves and of reality are essentially part of an elaborate ruse, a part of an elaborate strategy to avoid accountability and kind of an independent sense of, of um, sort of ethical consequences, which they can always divert onto their, either their naive and sort of oversimplistic understanding of what's going on around them or sort of profanely relying on how innocent they are and how pure their intentions are and so what, what i believe is actually happening in borderline personality disorder um and this goes to my my sort of my greater thesis and I, although i haven't i haven't argued for this uh, step by step in this recording I have done so in other recordings. Uh, what I believe is in essence happening is that the borderline personality disordered woman becomes her own infant. That her identity in some sense becomes her own helpless infant that needs to be protected ferociously and, and viciously with every emotional uh, sentiment and force that she has and because her own self-image is her infant then uh, the kind of psychopathy that she is driven to uh, uh, incorporate beliefs about her world um, is essentially, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's very rotten, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's completely, um, and it's interesting, because I think that this whole strategy doesn't just affect people who have this disorder, I think that it is something it is perhaps an extreme, I mean, you know, many people would say that borderline personality disorder is about degree, that perhaps everyone falls somewhere on the borderline personality disorder spectrum. And, and what you're arguing about is, is uh, differences of degree rather than if you have it or if you don't have it. And in some sense, I can, I can adopt that view because there's a, 
a sense in which everyone is prone to some level of magical thinking and cognitive dissonance or sort of self-deception, confabulation. Um, you know, where some people perhaps even more actively rely on certain mechanisms more than others. Some people will, will confabulate convenient memories. They, they will um, sort of rely on, on conjecture in a cherry-picked way just to kind of save their world view. You know, uh, the list kind of goes on. Um, what makes the borderline psychopathic is that this dishonesty um, is almost the most prominent feature of their personality. It, it's sort of, it's, it's the dominant impetus. It isn't, it doesn't just kind of um, appear when there's a chink in the armor. It's like, it's all there is. This is all it is that they ever do. Uh, there's no honest game that is being perpetrated in the background. There's no other operation that that is being sort of um, pursued. Uh, it's quite sad. Um, but anyway, the the thing that I'm very badly trying to explain is that. Women, I think, to some degree, they realize that this is a f almost like a, f uh, a feminine archetype that has its place in society. That uh, that is generally tolerated by society, and and I think in some sense. The, the selective pressure on women within our species has been far less than it has been on men. Men, essentially, um, even every generation, uh, get pruned from uh, humanity. They get rejected from leaving offspring, essentially. Women have never had that kind of negative selective pressure applied to them. The bar for being a successful woman, um, in terms of evolutionarily successful, uh, is usually just being physically fit enough to be fertile, essentially. And then, you know, 80% of women leave offspring. Uh, whereas something like it's only 40% of men. So, uh, the level at which negative selective pressure um, is impinging itself uh, against the sexes, it's like two to one. Um, so, if society starts doing badly, it sort of, uh, at least from an evolutionarily, uh, from an evolutionarily anthropological kind of perspective, uh, men are the disposable ones. Um, and so the incentive to get things right, let's just say, um, is uh, weighs much more heavily on men's shoulders than it does on women's shoulders. Uh, all, other, all other things being equal. Um, so, you know, if, if you kind of put it in the analogy of a kind of economic, uh, sort of fiscus, um, Women have been uh, offsetting their losses onto the men's ledger uh, throughout history for long enough 
for men to perhaps gain some kind of cultural uh, inbuilt pushback against women's influence over political decision making because essentially women don't bear the costs the same as men do. There's an interesting sort of tangent uh, on this topic that talks about um, polygamy. Uh, and and essentially what, what monogamy has done um, to, al to alter uh, some of this equation. Because I, I do think that in some sense without monogamy, we wouldn't have ever sort of embarked on this more egalitarian trend within society. Um, I, I do think that uh, polygamous societies would never, or, or would, would have a much less likelihood of uh, precipitating um, the kind of the cultural residue that would otherwise keep misogyny sort of in place. Um, Now that we've had sort of an ethical revolution in which um, we have tried to remove generalizations away from our cultural ethical uh, uh, structures, which I think is a positive move, uh, we have to be very quick um, to not go crazy and uh, I mean in some sense we've kind of already lost the plot because um, which has quite ironically been because of something that has happened under the name of feminism that essentially now a quality of outcome is is proof of systemic oppression almost taunting us to say well well that's because men and women don't want the same things they don't do the same things and therefore, they don't arrive at the same destinations. They don't arrive at the same outcomes. You know, you can't expect any more than what we've already achieved, essentially. If you want to improve things, then make an, a specific claim. Don't make a general statistical sort of inference of things. Um, you know, lies, lies and statistics. Please keep that to yourself say what you actually positively want you know say that you want something to happen in particular a, a particular measure a particular regulation and let's look at that on its merits and see how fair that is because we cannot just redistribute essentially the cost of a quality of outcome upon a, a, co a collective society that we're going to beleaguer with this act this blanket accusation of sexism because you don't get the statistics that that help reinforce your identitarian pride or something um, Anyway, back to borderline personality disorder. So, borderline personality disorder I think the reason it's with us is because in some sense it's almost been a 
a positive adaptation to society in the round in in general in that it has actually exacerbated um, male responsibility it's, it's kind of like the sentiment of treat me like a child and I will be very petulant and demanding uh, and I will use cultural conventions to back up my accusations and my claims and you have to satiate them um, and and get ready to put up with it that's kind of uh, i don't know that's my that's my loose generalization of of what borderline personality disorder is doing to culture um, and in some sense uh It's meant that culture has had to be more proficient at delivering to women some form of short-term gratification, uh, appeasing their demands, or at least the demands that they could conventionalize and, and to create a social construct. I mean, that's another thing that I was trying to... Um, describe at the beginning um, is that all of these uh, feminine sort of interfaces with culture are essentially premised in women dictating conventions as a block that they try to collectivize and speak in one voice in some sense uh, the reason why I think also feminism was or women were ejected from the political process uh, in traditional society um, is because women already had a kind of proto-political uh, internal conformity into leveraging social constructs um, and social norms and to making sure that social norms were um, simplified into a useful enough metric that they could leverage them culturally um, and, and, and so that they could be naively instrumentalized in enhancing their cultural power as women and I mean in some sense, I think something that, that uh, uh, exemplifies this to a large degree is fashion um, and style. You know, uh, why do men dress the way that, way that they dress? In some sense, it's because uh, it is generally understood that some group of women um, are setting the standard, are, are, are judging um, and, and that's exactly that. That's the kind of judgment that Cato the Elder was saying is a, is a frivolous indulgence that if it is given room, it sort of metastasizes and sort of becomes an all-consuming sort of um, usurpation of, of useful... Uh, it, it ends up corrupting culture and essentially uh, wasting resources. Um, because it gets more and more symbolic, it gets more and more ostentatious. It becomes more and more about sort of status. Um, and it gets less and less anchored and grounded in, let's say, principles and, and reality, perhaps, and pragmatism. Um, that's sort of Cato's, uh, Cato the Elder's, you know, sort, sort of description of this. Um, you know, and, and he complains that essentially all women want is, is more license uh, to have more of this kind of cultural power, which they wield as a block, and that's why it's 
so effectively kind of becomes an all-consuming judge in some sense. I'm sort of trying to describe what Cato the Elder was describing it and combining it with the archetype of the devouring mother. Um, you know, and it, it really is worth pointing out, you can't emphasize this enough, that identity politics came from feminism. Now, I don't think that women are incapable of normative ethics or principles, quite the opposite. Um, but I do think that uh, they might be more psychologically prone to undermining uh, a culture that is not stringent about normative principles. That, that there is very clearly, um, and, and, and what I'm describing is like, I'm, I'm very serious, like about what I'm saying, like, there are so many signs of this, they are blindingly, I mean, you, you literally have to be dishonest to look past them. If you, if you look at young girls playing with dolls in dollhouses, do you think they're not learning how social manipulation works? You, you think they're not learning how social conventions and social constructs uh, populate the boundaries of people's activities and, 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 their, uh, and what they're allowed to do and um, how they choose things? And if you empower women, inverted commas, by telling little girls that their uh, preferences and sentiments uh, are privileged because they, as, a, as an identity, has, have inherited historical forms of systemic oppression, um, you've just perversely incentivized them to manufacture grievances, but also to not participate, to not participate as genuine actors and, and good actors that are actually um, negotiating in good faith. Because all they have to do is rely on this narrative of a, of, of a social convention and then they can get their way. They can essentially play the victim or they can play the naive and innocent um, sort of... Uh, uh, and I do think that we will see a sharp uptick in borderline personality disorder. And I think it will be a di direct result of this kind of toxic ideological feminism. Um, because th that way of thinking about society and about people is dehumanizing on the same level that I believe borderline personality disorder is essentially a kind of socially manipulative psychopathy. So in some sense, you know, a male psychopath um, sees things from their own eyes, from their own subjective point of view. Whereas I'm saying borderline is a female variant of psychopathy in which her psychopathy is looking at people from society's point of view, from, from the point of a kind of social constructivist. Um, anyway. Uh, So sadly, you know, we are literally creating um, 
a pendulum with a lot of potential. I mean, we have just created a pendulum with so much potential energy. Um, perhaps it will be good. Because depending on how that potential energy is um, acquitted, how it's uh, discharged, will perhaps uh, meet us back to where we were in the 90s when we had these normative ethics and principles worked out uh, before they were thrown under the bus by these opportunistic feminists. Um, who essentially wanted quotas and wanted people to deliver to them excuses for their own lack of achievement. Somehow they wanted a kind of a collective excuse, uh, uh, a apology from society that there had not been a female Einstein or something like that. And I'm sorry, but you know, the patriarchy is not what is stopping women from equaling men on the right side of the IQ curve. Yes, the median woman is more intelligent than the median man, but that is because there are much more very stupid men and very intelligent men than there are women. That again, the negative selective pressure on women has been far, far lower. And so women have essentially tried to just maximize somewhere toward above average or something like that. Because that's all that is required to successfully procreate and continue the species and to have successful genes. Whereas men have had to deal not only with the biological selection process, but also uh, with propagating everything else and, you know, sort of uh, maintaining and inventing and uh, stopping things from falling apart. Uh, because when things fall apart, uh, it's the women and the children that get the lifeboats. And so there was something to that uh, traditional compact that I will say, you know, was in, you know, in, in the most, you know, at the most, at the, at the level of, of nuance, it was obviously wrong and it was based on generalizations and applying generalizations to people. And that is always morally deficient. Um, that's, in some sense, inexcusable when it can be avoided, um, or when it's reasonable uh, um, to expect that it should be avoided. Uh, there are also amoral cases where it doesn't matter if you avoid it or not because it's just essentially not a moral question. Um, That tangent aside, um, there was at least some modicum of balance within the traditional system, is that men had the responsibility, and they also essentially paid for that responsibility. They paid the price Or you could say it was costed into the 
the social contract. Um, and women have not been willing to be instrumentalized to the same degree that men have acclimatized themselves to being instrumentalized. And I'll also say that they have been instrumentalized by women. And, you know, this is not women's fault. This is just uh, a residue of evolutionary history. You know, I mean, the reason why our species conquered and fought successfully against the other hominid species on this planet is because when we killed the Neanderthals, uh, we killed their men and their women because we faced their men and their women when we clashed. Whereas we only lost men. Homo sapiens sapiens. Our casualties were all men. Because our women were gatherers. And they were far away from the clashes and from the front lines. And so when we took casualties, it was the disposable male. And that did not dent, essentially, the next generation. So our population was relatively uh, robust because of our specialization between the sexes. And that gave us a selective advantage, essentially, against other societies. against other hominid species that didn't have a division of labor, we eventually uh, displaced them. And, you know, this division in labor has essentially created niches that, that women have had uh, and which women have obviously developed within something that we call culture. And I do think that to a large extent, even this borderline personality disorder stuff, although there's probably a biological component to it, a, a large part of it is probably cultural. And it could probably be uh, greatly um, attenuated and controlled uh, via a healthy culture. They didn't encourage uh, what is essentially now the dehumanization of men. Because, you know, as soon as you break down and you essentially regulate sexuality through an ideology, you've kind of already in principle... created a, a, a powder keg you, you've created a perverse incentive to keep on doubling down on that on that first move until you've got a kind of a, a totalitarian narrative a kind of cultural totalitarianism or, or some kind of incredibly abstracted disembodied ideological narrative that judges everyone judges everyone's identity you know you've because you, you need something large enough and big enough and sort of distant and remote enough that you can think that, yes, this is actually defining how my sexuality should be regulated. It has to be that esoteric enough. It has to be sort of that strange and utopian. 
I do think that that the the ideology of identity politics is 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 very much like fascism. It's exactly like the fascist world unit operates like that, but um, it's got that same kind of mythology around it. Um, So many people have been inducted into this very sick and dark uh, ideology. I, I wonder, I really do wonder what the long-term impact will be. I mean, I can only imagine that if these people become parents and they raise children, that their children are going to be, are going to be in for a terrible time. They're either they're going to be indoctrinated by a vacuous and shallow moral paradigm that will have dehumanization built into its core precept, into its core. You know, it it will be like blind racialist hatred and other forms of hatred based on generalizations and categorizations. And that is not to say that generalizations aren't roughly maybe true on some level, but that doesn't mean that they have to carry any kind of moral water, that they have any kind of moral impact or imputation uh, that can be correlated to, to, a, to a generalization. But they, that's how they source their morality. If they don't have generalizations, they don't even have a morality because all they have is their moral picture essentially. They have to believe in a mythologized claim of systemic oppression against the collective to be visited against a, a targeted scapegoat. Anyway, I'm just pointing out that uh, it was feminism that ignited this torch of fascism within our society and this torch of cultural totalitarianism that essentially invented a whole new generation of new racists, essentially, and, and racial consciousness. Um, and, and I do think that these kinds of worldviews also have other forms of very special and subtle forms of child abuse packed into them. Uh, because that kind of toxicity, it doesn't just manifest itself as a, um, as a compartmentalized political project. Uh, it's, it's an ethos. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a fascistic ethos as well. It's, um, and to escape its own hypocrisy and double standards and cognitive dissonances and general moral incoherence, it has to participate in some kind of ritualistic expression of exonerating themselves from the blanket accusations of systemic oppression. You know, they have to somehow prove that they're on the right side. So you have to kind of go and join the mob and join some witch hunt somewhere that's being orchestrated. You know, to sort of be part of some kind of show trial or something like that. Um, the only thing that, that I wish I could link this up to through through this recording more viscerally, because I can't really describe it that well, but is how much that culture is the blueprint of the borderline personality disordered. codependency and also projection onto their reality how much that it is a bit it is a bit of an analogy because the thing is is that in some sense when you are in identity politics you yourself do not have borderline personality disorder it's more in the line of that your identity has borderline personality disorder and you belong collectively to your identity. So it's kind of like, it's slightly broader in terms of 
making the analogy work. Anyway, I, I have so many recordings that, that kind of go into this and, and, and talk about this, but um, So have I even spoken about the Devouring Mother? Um, it is interesting because I do think on some level, maybe this is a cyclical thing and this happens. It's a culture in order to create a new generation of independent critical thinkers. That you need a vicious... sort of cultural totalitarianism in order to have something that's worth defeating. Something that's worth slaying. Uh, some obstacle or hurdle that will be the essentially the the quest and also the advent of the return of the king It is a bit sad just how little societal resilience there is to this kind of ideological subversion but yeah I mean in some sense the reason why I talk about feminism and I try to unpack these things and grapple with these things is because I think culture or society in general has already been devoured by the devouring mother. And, and the question is, is it's not going to be enough uh, to just complain about... Uh, sort of the stomach acids uh, of, of that are dissolving our structures. We have to name the thing that placed society and culture in the position that it's in. We have to recount exactly how it happened, what happened, and who did it, and why they did it, and examine the cogency of their thinking and, and the, the merit of their 
explanations uh, or we're not going to be able to undo the damage or even realize what's happened uh, will just be sort of trying to find a way to neutralize this wave of stomach acid. We cannot just protest about being devoured. We need to find a way to rebuke the devouring mother. And to a large extent, I, I think that the devouring mother is kept intact because of essentially what is inequality. And what I mean by that is that you cannot criticize a woman to the same degree that you can criticize a man in society today. This is blatant, abject sexism. We don't have common standards. We only have double standards. And we can't just say this about everyone. The reason why we have double standards is because you cannot interrupt a woman like you can interrupt a man. Who is promoting these double standards? It's to a large extent under the aegis and the bulwark of feminism, so-called feminism. It doesn't matter, I mean, if it is or if it isn't feminism, that's what they self-identify as. And they use that tactic to play this kind of semantic terrorism with meaning itself, with languages itself, with redefining words, and essentially using that subversive form of incepting the culture uh, by awarding themselves with the moral high ground, which you know, they, they shift the burden of proof. You know, they call, if you don't agree with them, they call you phobic. Because then, then they don't have to deal with your substantive argument. They just force you to prove that you're not phobic first. With their moral panic and, and hysteria. Because we are already devoured. And at some point we have to play the game where we're not just debunking them and refuting them, but we are debunking and refuting their style of engagement, their dishonest form of pseudo-politicking and dialogue, which is, you know, it, it's... It's essentially a waste of time, but I would say engage in it to the extent to which that you can show to an audience just how manufactured their whole uh, semantic games and, 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 you know, you can really dissect their... It really is possible to, to dissect their tricks in real time uh, and have that be part of, of essentially your description of the polemic, that of, of their cultural totalitarianism and, and how dishonest it is. Okay, so I know that I haven't given the full sort of account for it, but essentially the form over substance, let's say, uh, instrument of social manipulation is by far in large uh, generalized into the, the feminine camp of uh, utilization. 
and you know i i would say that there there is a i would say a fairly well supported evolutionarily you know f from the perspective of evolutionary psychology you can see why that makes sense because uh, women have much more secured membership uh, within the tribe, within the group, because just their presence uh, um, sort of adds to a pro-social uh, confidence that, that the power of one's collective, of one's group, um, is more greatly ensured by uh, protecting the interests of women. So women have this kind of biological capital because they are um, necessary, that, that they are in some sense the uh, most necessary link in the chain, whereas uh, in, in terms of having a growing population, which is uh, all other things being equal, a very important consideration when you are politically vying against other collectives, other societies, other cultures. So uh, a society that does not privilege the interests of their female population um, or, or, and, and that does not uh, placate to, to their demands or whatever, um, at least well enough to allow them to, to uh, play their role in biological reproduction, uh, is going to be disadvantaged relative to other societies that um, safeguard their women, essentially. So societies that don't tend towards male disposability um, are effectively punished in the contest between cultures and civilizations. Um, anyway, uh, that's the kind of uh, the analytical sort of background to why there is a niche that women can um, have the extra leeway to play this game where they rely on form rather than substance. And that society must be represented to the, the female gaze. And again, I'm, these are all generalizations. Uh, in a form which is simple enough to be utilized uh, to some kind of, you know... Uh, maximizing exploitation and i think in this niche we have the the particular variant uh, uh which is also part and parcel i think of of the female opportunistic sexual strategy uh, uh, but also of engaging in a form of of relatively well uh disguised or concealed psychopathy so essentially uh, in some sense, male psychopaths um, and males in general have negative selective pressures to worry about. And in some sense, I think that um, psychopathy might even be, um, in the evolutionary line, uh, an unpopular trait unless it could come to heal and come to conform to at least, you know, the... the I mean, Men, have, men do things that women don't really have to worry about. Men really have to know who they can trust. And not just in terms of, um, you know, they have to really build camaraderie. They, they have to really uh, know how much they can rely on other people. Uh, again, uh, when they fail to do so, uh, you know, the, the people who absorb the, the, the penalty for this, essentially... Uh, the stress in any society because it's women and children that are uh, protected because they don't have the responsibility that men are um... and, and again like this dichotomy of responsibility in some sense or of leadership in inverted commas or governance um, 
is toxically reinforced by uh, women taking on, let's say, the borderline valence, which I think is is broader than just um, those who have the particular personality disorder. I think that what we generally think of as femininity is, in some sense, almost a subset of borderline characteristics and traits. It's as if that that strategy, um, which you can just usually call like, you know, social manipulation or something like that, is explored by girls growing up. I mean, again, this is a generalization. Um, and, and there might even be a very strong biological basis to this. I mean, you know, in, it's very clear in the literature that uh, you, you leave boys and girls to their own devices and boys will play with cars and trains and things. And essentially, the, the characteristic that was shown in these studies is that boys will gravitate towards outside scenes and outside scenarios in their play when they're playing with toys boys will make an outside kind of um imaginative uh, environment and girls when when they play they make indoors imaginative environments they make houses they they look at interpersonal human relationships and and interrelated uh, uh you know within the context of social conventions women care about interpersonal things or girls that, that that's what they gravitate towards again this is a generalization but it's a you have to be blind and and you have to actually completely ignore all the real evidence and and the studies that have been done i mean if you the tomes of evidence between i mean also the the, the brain physiolo physiology which is generally um the reason why it's so different is because the hormones are so different. You know, uh, uh, a very young male infant has the same levels of testosterone in their body as a, uh, um, like I'm talking about like a three-month-old infant, a six-month-old male infant has the same level of testosterone as boys going through puberty. Uh you know, you, you think that that's not going to have an effect on the brain. You don't think all that testosterone is going to change the development of a brain. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, but anyway, just going back to opportunistic sexual strategies, you can understand that men in some sense or, or boys as they grow up they have they they have a certain threshold of disposability that they have to overcome in some and so at some point they have to essentially earn the calories that they consume they have to provide value some kind of pro-social value to their community in some sense in order to gain uh, status within their society and generally then they they hope to trade that status in for um, being able to to win uh, companionship or 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 being the, the opportunity to mate and to leave their genes behind within their within a, a society, uh, which they do so by outbidding uh, com uh, their competition, which are other males, and so because women. Uh, don't essentially target their peers for companionship. They target um, essentially uh, potential avenues of advancement in socioeconomic status, or, or you could just call it uh, uh, social power or something like that. All they have to do is be able to understand a hierarchy within a civilization or within a society and to try to make themselves available. So the kind of the, the sexual marketplace um, from a woman's perspective, there is a real opportunity for advancement, for um, gaining access to uh, 
higher quality either uh, security or um, access to resources. Uh, which would be crazy f for women not to track because, you know, uh, be because of the stresses of pregnancy, essentially, um, and the and the vulnerability of pregnancy, that, that one has to have a safe and... Uh, one has to be able to, to know that one can be provided for, essentially. Um, and being able to read that and gravitate towards that is going to confer a sort of a selective advantage. Um, so for a woman not to try to game sort of the opportunity for social uh, upliftment, which we, we must remember as well, comes very early in some sense, because uh, we essentially know that... Um, the prime years, you know, just from a biological standpoint, the prime years for, for reproduction uh, from a woman's perspective, which is much more onerous um, than a man. Men can be fertile for a much greater window because they don't actually have to uh, grow a fetus inside their body. So, um, you know, the, the, the biological contribution to, to, to the actual reproductive, um, the physical reproductive act is, um, is, is, is minuscule, especially in comparison to the female biological input, you know, so, uh, women have to, uh, be picky unless you have essentially, um, this kind of crazy culture that we have developed, which has perversely incentivized um, what I would generally refer to as the opportunistic female sexual strategy. You know, so we've got judges and we've got alimony and we've got child support where it doesn't matter uh, if a woman seeks some kind of trust with her partner or, or uh, w w which becomes the father of a biological offspring it doesn't matter if she trusts him or not she will still be able as long as she knows sort of uh where to find his bank account and she has access to a judge she can extract child support um so you know w we have you know, in, in the interest of the child, we have essentially created a culture uh, which doesn't place any burden of accountability or responsibility um, on the shoulders of a woman for uh, acting responsibly or, you know, or having sort of accountability for her, for her actions. Somehow a man is always accountable um, before she is. Uh, this, I think, is, is doubly worrisome because this is exactly the kind of borderline strategy. Uh, and, and so I, I think, you know, again, uh, what we have actually done in our society is we have degraded sexual mores uh, or sexual mores to such a, a point that our, our normative, let's say, structure um, is so toxic, it perversely incentivizes, you know, the, the, the most hideous forms of unaccountable female sort of opportunism to, because essentially she can always decide after the fact, you know, she can get pregnant first and then she can either choose uh, she can work out if the guy has any, you know, she doesn't even have to know his name as long as he looked like he, he had a good car. And then if, if it turns out that the car is a lease and he, and he has a dead end job and he's, you know, he, he is just very good at, uh, looking flashy or whatever. At that point she can have an abortion or if she works out that he actually does come from means, then, you know, uh, 
if she's become pregnant by him, then that's her meal ticket in the future. So it's like the ball is always in her court and she never has to sort of, uh, you know, she can sort of rely on, on this uh, sexual strategy. Um, so every advantage in the modern social realm, in some sense, has been conferred over to the, the opportunistic female sexual strategy. It used to be that the male and the female opportunistic fem uh, sexual strategy almost counterbalanced each other to some degree, that the man might disappear like a kind of, and, 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 and you know, sort of like a narcissist, um, do sorts of things and and it used to be that you know the all the narcissist had to do was pretend that he would settle down and and offer commitment now it doesn't really matter so much if he's offering commitment or not uh, and also you know this very sort of toxic reliance on state power to supplement for lack of let's say, negotiation and decision-making, you know, so, so we've sort of, we've ejected trust from the sexual marketplace. We've tried to make that a non-issue um, as we've supplemented for it uh, in, in what I would call as generally toxic social moors. Um, and I think that, that this has been doubled down into politics. It, 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 this is the ground zero. This is the template that has sort of now progressed into a kind of a socialistic utopian dream that essentially we can just use blanket accusations against anyone who stands in the way of providing to some hysterically, you know, sort of shrieking woman as to what she believes she deserves uh, to extract from somebody else um, by pain of, of you know, uh, some kind of judicial procedure that the law stands behind her and essentially we now have this corruption of law itself into a form it, in which it, it kind of can enforce these more and more elaborate sort of social dicta that, that have been manifesting around this very dark, you know, identity politics, social movement. But, um, I do think that although identity politics might be debunked in its own sphere of, of control, I think that we'll never actually get a handle on it unless we understand its actual cultural source. Um, anyway, it, it's... Uh, And it is interesting that essentially um, Cato the Elder warned us about this. Uh, and by not wishing to take a more nuanced and, and let's say honest confronting of what it is that these people were talking about, uh, by just wanting to dismiss them as, as being misogynistic rather than saying, well, there are differences between the sexes. That doesn't mean that we should treat people differently. It's just, this is something that should be part of our cultural awareness. Because if we're not responsive to reality, uh, you know, if, if we want to say that men and women are biologically the same, I mean, what the hell is that supposed to mean? It's, you know, it's... Uh, men and women have access to the same good life, but they have different impediments and obstacles because they are not the same. They are the same, they should be treated the same under law. And that's a bit of a challenge in some respects, because uh, 
you know, family law because of, of uh, custody and, and, and because of those sorts of questions, you know. Uh, you know, how much sexism is there in the system and how, how well is it substantiated and justified and reasoned and how much has it taken everything into account? Uh, these are things which, you know, this new breed of feminism has no idea how to do. It has no sensitivity towards any of those questions. Um, it just replaces all, you know, sort of actual debate that needs to be hashed out uh, and actual investigation and discussion with hysterical, shrieking, you know, demands and, and uh, moral panics and emergencies and uh, hyperbolic language about domestic abuse and, and things like that, when it's not understood that, you know, a lot of the problems that we see in society are because women are held unaccountable for their decisions, because there is this presumed innocence and, and naivety and under the concealment of those social conventions, we have psychopaths running amok, uh, destroying people's lives, uh, being incredibly abusive, but being able to conceal that abuse under the fact that they got to provoke uh, the man that they're abusing to physically uh, uh, strike back at them. And then they can use that bruise as a badge of honor, essentially, to, to vindicate their, their moral purity. Um, you know, th this is a kind of asymmetrical uh, corruption. And because our eyes are not open to this asymmetrical corruption that women are uh, prone to perpetrate, um, I mean, our culture has been devoured by it. I mean, Stefan Molyneux, uh, I think, is, is one of the earliest speakers who... Um, who started making waves and, and talking about this, essentially the, the pathologies of, of uh, essentially female dysfunction. And, you know, how, how many male monstrosities uh, uh, come about because of their failed mothers or, uh, th 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 that are, that incubated uh, and destroyed the psyches of their children to, to create these monsters. And, and how much does that go by the boards? How much is that, does society close their eyes to this? Because we cannot put any kind of emphasis on treating women to the same standards, the same moral standards that we do of men. Somehow they're just always above it. They are always beyond reproach. And, and this is, I think, the basic sexism that actually underpins all the unresolved residue that we now come to see. And the reason why it never gets any better is because counterintuitively, we, we don't scrutinize women. They, get a, they still get a free pass. And in some sense, this hysterical, you know, sort of identity politics stuff is... is uh, um, almost a, a direct manifestation of that toxicity. And, and, and this is why it's, it's always so strange that, you know, in the narrative that is being peddled from the so-called left, how much projection there is in this, you know, how the very things that they use in their headlines, they are guilty of, you know, it's, it's absolutely crazy. Um, This is the thing that happens when sort of form comes to displace substance. I saw Vosch. It's kind of disgusts me that this comes up in my YouTube feed. Vosch made this video about uh, Tim Poole. 
and, and he says something about Tim Pool, uh, stupid or dishonest. <laughs> I watched like one minute of this video and I couldn't believe, you know, is Vosch stupid or dishonest? <laughs> I mean, I think he's both. Uh, I, I think he can't not be dishonest. Um, but he's stupid that he thinks that, 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 that people can't sort of see the game that he's playing, you know, it's, um, you know, it, it's sort of, it's, it's that kind of sarcasm, uh, that is leveraged when you don't have a, a substantive position. You just kind of say things in an, in an, in an incredulous tone of voice. Uh, and this is exactly what you see from women, uh, when they're holding their, their moral high ground that they've sort of awarded to themselves as they have sort of uh, shifted the burden of proof. And you, so the weird thing is, is that women and men are most different in their sexual uh, in, in how they communicate their sexuality. Somehow, uh, yeah. women expect to be placated, they, they expect to be sort of um, reckoned with, you know, somehow their alphaness has to be. Um, either subdued or something like that, or, or it has to be um, surrendered to, or it has to be compromised with, or something like that. And and the person who should be doing that, it should be their partner, or something like that. It, it shouldn't be a public valence that they use. But they keep on sort of mirroring their, their, their sexual role into the public sphere, uh, men can't do that. Uh, men have to compartmentalize their lives to some extent. Um, Just going to elaborate this um, this model. Uh, I mean, to some extent, this is more of a, a cultural, structural thing. This is a very complicated issue because it really has to do with many sort of factors. I mean, one of the factors is, I, I think, just the, the differing levels of ego development uh, between individuals. Um, I mean, there are definitely women who have well-developed, mature egos and that can be professional and that can compartmentalize their lives. Um, but in the current cultural, let's say, uh, system, uh, it's this idea that women are empowered by their, what I would say, although it isn't mentioned like this, but essentially they are empowered by their opportunistic sexual strategy. 
and although it's incredibly toxic uh, and it requires i think this this toxic chain of being doubling doubled down into a more elaborate form of of sort of political destabilization and and many other things that uh, that get destabilized as as a byproduct um sort of lower IQ women are being told essentially that they can depend on this toxic sexual strategy as a as an augmentation of their lack of professionalism in some sense and their lack of being able to navigate their lives and so if they lack anything that they want they can just merely make uh, you know a kind of conjectured comparison and, and sort of openly envy somebody else who has something that they want and say, well, they got it because of their identity and my identity uh, deserves more. And so you have this kind of this strange kind of groping for some kind of formulated uh, extraction of, of an ought from an is. And there's, there's sort of, there's no common sense. Uh, there's no pragmatism. There's no thought of anything other than essentially this identity-centric. Um, and again, I, I, I do see it as, as it being sourced from this... Uh, it, it, it sort of, it's tapped into what I would generally call this... Uh, opportunistic female sexual strategy um, uh, I realize that this is this is almost like a, a psychosocial conspiracy theory um, but I mean on the face of it there are some very convenient facts that support uh, my claims uh, which is that this did come from feminism um, the blanket accusations and systemic oppression sort of motif uh, was injected into the culture from feminism. And that is still, I think, what is drip dripping it into the system and what is sort of keeping it alive. That if, if that, if the root of that, if that was unanchored, if, if that was challenged and, and, and successfully uh, uprooted, I think the rest of, of the uh, movement would essentially lose its energy because it is, I think, being fueled by the idea that, oh, well, the only way that we're going to arrive at sort of a functional uh, sort of, uh, the only way that we're going to arrive back at a kind of functioning sexuality, which has been... Um, gated in our culture by this kind of toxic ideology it has been locked up by this toxic ideology the only way that, that we're going to achieve some kind of functioning uh, sexual relations between the sexes again is if we plug ourselves into this project into this program which now you know has this has doubled down into this um very you know remote and abstract utopian vision um, you know, kind of lending its weight into this, this strategy of looking at everything from a narrative perspective, um, you know, sort of, which breaks this relativism paradox, uh, that somehow you're looking at the system from beyond the system, um, By the way, I know that some of uh, what I'm saying now sort of contradicts my style of things because I almost I try to even offer some perspectives from an evolutionary perspective and things like that. Um, if you go through some of, some of my recordings when I'm talking about this stuff, I, I do explain that the opportunistic sexual strategy is a good approximate of what it actually is, but it's not actually what it what it is. In, in truth, 
because that is only true if you kind of look at it from the outside and collectivize it. So I'm kind of just explaining it that way because it, it's more readily sort of um, imagined that way. And to actually give the actual explanation is much more complicated. But essentially, when a young, when a young child is growing up <clears throat> and they have been inducted into uh, what I would call a kind of a toxic moral framework or something like that, when they are essentially ventured into a form of nihilism, um, perhaps because their own developmental environment is incredibly um, disruptive and, and pathological to some degree. I, I think that uh, children perhaps know at a certain age that they should not be using the people in their vicinity as a role model. Um, they, they essentially, uh, they rebel against their role models. Um, and so what they do instead is they, um, they generalize more broadly as to what, as to how to play the game. And I think this is when psychopathy uh, in both men and women uh, develop in their two different, roughly their two different strains, that girls will develop borderline personality disorder and boys will develop narcissism. Um, and borderline personality disorder is, just happens to be more sophisticated than narcissism. They, they both have very similar themes in them. But, and, and the reason why I think that they are different is because how to get attention as a boy and how to get attention as a girl means something different in a culture that has concepts like femininity and masculinity. That because sexual success is different for men than it is to women, and sexual power is different, that when they are looking at how to game the system and, and how to achieve success, uh, they come up with different strategies, with different plans. And then they also, what they come up with has to be imprinted on their own internal structures and circuitry. It, ha it has to, it has to be adopted as a, as a, as a, as a schematic in terms of their developmental structure. And so they end up with different developmental structures. It's, it's not merely that they have adopted different strategies. It's that they have imprinted different strategies into their developmental line. And so this is why I say borderline personality disorder just happens to be more sophisticated than, uh, narcissism but 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 anyway um but essentially uh it can be roughly equated uh, to the fact that uh men and women are different but it it really it, it you know, it sort of was it the chicken before the egg. It's like they are, in some sense, well, because they're different, there are cultural differences. And because there are cultural differences, there are therefore developmental differences when those cultural differences are being imprinted uh, upon the, the structure of psychology. So, you know, it's sort of... Um, and, and I do have a more detailed breakdown of exactly what... And again, I have to speak somewhat in generalities, what the difference in the development of, of those structures are, which I'm, I'll probably have to update them now. But um, now that I've got a more updated uh, a structure of, uh, of personality, but in some sense, I think that people are generally aware of these things, but they usually in most people, they become kind of background models. So, and I, 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 I generally also think that many girls do develop some variant of borderline personality disorder um, almost reflexively. 
which I think is mainly a sort of a cultural thing that, that because it's, it's culturally facilitated to a large degree, um, or at least it has been for, for quite a while in our, in our culture. Um, although there are outliers, there are girls who rebel against, uh, you know, who sort of, who, who sort of swim against the tide, as it were, and they kind of, they, they betray their own, let's say, cultural niche, and, and because they see it as a toxic form of cultural hegemony, or, or, or they see it as, as being vacuous, um, but there is kind of minority, so I mean, I have the hope that what's, what we're going through now culturally is going to eventually break the back of what has been a kind of a cultural toxin that we have sat with, that we have inherited uh, as, as, a, as a, even a, a very deep historical residue, but it is something that we do need to work through. Uh, but it does, it's going to require more honesty than we currently have about um, the, the differences between the sexes. Anyway, I should probably write my book on personality styles and then have a whole chapter to sexual culture and, and or sexuality and, and the differences between the sexes within a cultural con uh, within some kind of a cultural context and, and within um, commenting on, on the developmental structures of, of these uh, psychopathologies as well, but also as, as broad um, I mean it, it's, it, I mean in recent history, no one can deny the, um, the acceleration and proliferation of borderline personality disorder, which I mean, when people say that, oh, narcissism is exploding, I think that they actually, they misdiagnose what is in fact what I would call a kind of hybridized borderline personality disorder. And um, what what happens on, on the masculine side of the fence to a large extent is what I call um, something that is very sympathetic to this hybridized borderline personality disorder, which I have roughly called cerebral histrionic sort of presentation. Um, anyway, I, I do probably have to get my thinking more in order in all these sorts of uh, camps and, and to reformulate them slightly uh, now that I have a sort of a more particular uh, model of development. Um, Although, I mean, it, it's going to be, yeah, this is, this is, sadly, I, I'm, I'm afraid that I might be at a point at my research where I can't really go much further without um, collaborating with uh, people who have direct um, clinical uh sort of uh, supervision of data sets, but also um, sort of collating patterns and things like that, and doing some sort of painstaking work of perhaps also getting a hold of, of you know, sort of dabbling in the realm of, of child psychology. Um, And being able to sort of, because uh, there are always going to be variations in, in perhaps particular developments, and you know there are probably particular distinctions to be drawn out. Um, although I, I should be able to be pretty successful at making general claims and remarks. Uh, 
about certain structures. But anyway, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm actually quite excited because I, I think that my structures are, um, will be the scaffolding in, in which psychology can actually uh, begin. Uh, I, I think never before has there been um, a platform upon which psychology could ever coalesce around. Uh, and I think I have roughly uncovered the, um, I'd say, or at least the, the philosopher's stone in terms of um, the field of psychology, which uh, certainly needed it and and will have the potential to kind of bring everything into, uh, you know, is a kind of phenomenal, phenomenological system and metaphysics that can sort of bring philosophy out of controversy and into a kind of coherent focus enough to start to straighten everything out uh, and sort of prove what I've been saying all along, which is that, you know, until we regard psychology as the queen of the sciences, you're not going to have anything uh, other than just a kind of mediocrity that, that we've had forever. Okay, I'm just going to retrace some of uh, what I've been espousing by sort of creating a, a bit of an analogous sort of allegory uh, to exemplify and more concretely espouse what exactly the problem is. Um, so... I think that sort of what this all boils down to is just how important and, and I mean this is sort of meant slightly tongue-in-cheek but it, it, it really is getting at the root of it. it is just how important it is that girls and women endure endure male jerks in their development of their character that specifically are jerks in the sense that they are able to puncture the narrative bubble that is created by uh, girls and women relying on social conventions and simplistic, unsubstantiated sort of um, metrics and sort of naive pictures that are used as bulwarks and uh, in order to facilitate social manipulation. And so when women are exposed to having to endure someone being a jerk to them in some sense, they actually have to uh, substantively defend themselves as an individual rather than sort of relying on some kind of uh, identitarian claim that that sort of supplements their self-esteem they actually have to work out how to ground their character and anchor it in something that can sort of stand up to uh you know in this allegory a boy or a man being a jerk to them that they actually have to know sort of where the boundaries are instead of cocooning themselves in a kind of reality tunnel which is uh comprised of essentially what becomes a more and more female dominated um, sort of context. Uh, and because of the conformity of whatever simplicity of, of some social convention, uh, never stands up to any kind of real scrutiny. So, Boys and men are sort of, they are expected to endure this sort of uh, 
uh, from the beginning. That they are expected, you know, boys will be boys and they have to just kind of uh, sort it out amongst themselves, sort out some kind of pecking order, sort out some kind of competence hierarchy. Uh, and, you know, th and there can be social structures and social hierarchies that are, let's say, not not substantive, that they are sort of basically corrupt or they're, they're, they're built on uh, some kind of symbolism or, or something like that. Uh, but at least the floor, the groundwork is visible to whatever uh, boys need to do or, or you know, it's it sort of it's it's ground into them that, well, they actually need to have a sense of establishing their own independent sense of, of self-worth. Or, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of that independent mode of working out things for yourself and giving some kind of epistemic groundwork to your own, you know, creating value from an independent source instead of um using an external locus of control like society and, and societal conventions. Uh, boys and men, I think, more are, are more prone to developing that sense of internal locus of control because of um, the abrasiveness that they are expected to endure. And in some sense, the traditional arrangement, which was very segregated on, on the lines of, of biological sex uh, being mirrored into some kind of social convention, um, protected women from having to put up with having to develop that kind of independent uh, uh, critical thinking um, by essentially protecting them from not having to substantiate themselves in some kind of independent way. Um, And, you know, uh, and, and this, th this was sort of, um, I would say, I mean, maybe it was first broken down by moves towards egalitarianism, uh, which I think are, are positive moves. Uh, the problem is, is that this kind of developmental crux of this issue, uh, was never properly realized, um, because essentially, uh, instead of seeing the need for women to develop their characters to the same degree that men develop their characters or between boys and girls, um, we've instead sort of created this toxic double standard, uh, which I would say is, has been specifically heralded by these new forms of feminism and these new waves of feminism, that um, you know, the difference between outcome is because of systemic oppression. Um, as social conventions has have been um, weaponized and sort of um, been used in in sort of in in very surreal uh, uh, you know this weird kind of self delusional you know sort of um, gerrymandered way of trying to construct a reality tunnel. Um, in order to preserve what is perhaps the most sort of immature um, permutation of, of so-called feminine, you know, sort of uh, uh, cultural um, beingness, you know, that, that essentially to be a woman has been defined, you know, in terms of feminism and, and, and identity politics, to essentially be uh, a child that never grows up, and that gets to live in their reality tunnel unpunctured by you know any kind of upset or any kind of need to ground or substantiate their own integrity on an independent basis that they need to be able to rely on women as a block uh, um, setting the stage and controlling the narrative as it were um, sort of gaslighting anything that upsets their ideological narrative. So, I mean, the summary 
really here is is that women need jerks. Uh, they need to be exposed to jerks in order to develop the same kind of character development that boys and men uh, sort, of, sort of develop. Although, I mean, I would say that also, I mean, in the current cultural toxicity, um, you know, how, how boys are having to rationalize these weird kinds of ideological constructs which are being imported into their their worldview, you know, uh, create this this weird kind of very disorientating and delusional sort of these weird sorts of double standards, which I think would tend towards perhaps people um, generating some kind of very far removed abstracted narrative that then they have to believe that you know, uh, and I. I in order to square all of those circles, I think you have to kind of, um, you have to really start accelerating your kind of your hyper realism and, and, you know, the kind of strange culture that Weimar Germany was sort of, um, inundated with, uh, the parallels are, are, are crazy with the Nuremberg dissatisfaction marches and such, um, and the demand for justice for the identity, uh, uh, you know, the kind of the the undermining of liberal values that the electorate should not be held accountable for the political um, decision making, you know, uh, that, you know, that something should come and save the identity and essentially uh, remove political accountability from the people themselves that they must just sort of be catered to and pandered to and infantilized um you know it's the kind of it's the end of of being a grown-up as it were um and you start really living in, in a weird kind of mythological reality and hyper realism um that i i think can be summarized as having this narrative quality to it um uh but anyway, just going back to um, the ideological toxicity, I think to a large degree that, again, to emphasize this, that I think that essentially sexuality has been taken hostage by this ideology. And so people have to sort of, are perversely incentivized to engage with it because of how it has captured the imagination and let's say, uh, you know, this false empowerment that women as a block can exert this weird kind of political force over society because they have taken sort of sexuality hostage. And the only way to kind of, uh, to not go against that, because I mean, in some sense that the real solution really is non-participation. The real solution is to essentially say, culture is toxic. I'm, I must not judge myself in, in the vision of how society um, evaluates things. I, I can't say, well, this is what is popular and unpopular, and therefore it has some kind of moral currency. You really have to divorce yourself from the, the current social mores, or at least what is advertised to be the current social mores, um, you know, uh, in terms of editorial journalism in, in terms of uh, you know popular opinion uh, all these things are so toxic they, they, they are so deluded and so conjoined with this weird kind of ideological narrative and, and reality tunnel that you really have to say you know uh, I, I, I must actually see it as a merit to be counterculture. I can't, I can't be a part of this culture. It, it is just sick. Um, and so, you know, if, if you don't sort of judge women by that standard and you don't, you know, see women as dangerous to the extent to which that they have not separated themselves from what is essentially a kind of a, a toxic dead end, you know, that, that it's, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, is just going to become more and more dysfunctional and more and more pathological and you know the kind of uh the weird kind of the scapegoating and the witch hunts that the reality tunnel you know 
is, is sort of um, facilitating uh, all of those are, are symptoms of things that uh, you know and I mean what, what this all re really does boil down to is that like ordinary sexuality has been pathologized by this cult uh, by this cultural hegemon uh, that has installed itself and taken over and so you know I would say that uh you really just have to kind of make a substantive th thing and you have to, you know, you can't deal with these people uh, with any kind of good faith because they are parasites to good faith. They will essentially, wh whatever uh, charity and good faith you, you might have to give, uh, they are there to chew it out and, and, and spit it back in your face. You know, it's, um, that is the kind of vampirism that the reality tunnel is um, invested into. That's the kind of the devouring mother uh, that has gotten a hold of sort of um, the cultural middle ground has been taken over, and 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 you know all values uh, have have been distorted um, as even words themselves have been redefined and and lost their ordinary meaning. Um, you know, a lot of things are being subverted. And if you don't sort of separate yourself from that subversion, you're going to run into very many problems. Um, and when I say separate yourself, I just mean consciously, you know, um, and knowing that when you're dealing with these people, you, you are dealing um in a in in somewhat of a of a rigged game uh in which you know there's every trick in the book to kind of confirm their own and validate their own sort of reality tunnel um you know it, it's like a self-fueling prophecy that that you're up against um and any amount of dishonesty can be utilized in order to confirm their own ac blanket accusations, which their whole worldview is premised on. So, 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 so once you see this, you know, you, you just, I guess you try find the unicorns that haven't bought into this, you know, kind of um, uh, mob mentality or something like that, uh, which I do think it is generally quite hard for uh, girls to do because when girls are girls are almost designed uh, again like um, you know they they play with dolls they play with indoor scenes that's what they imagine that's what they put their attention on that's what they focus on they want to understand how society works because they are at a prime opportunity earlier in their lives to radically advance their position within their socioeconomic standing um, by just knowing how society works. Uh, you know, hy hypergamy is, is, a, is a curse, but, you know, it's sort of, I mean, women really, um, they create a lot of anxiety for themselves or resentment because in some sense they always know the one woman in that they know about that was at the right party at the right time and sort of got to have a relationship with a celebrity or, you know, it, it's sort of like a casino. And the thing is, is that you can know how to uh, maximize your odds, but you still have to roll the dice as it were. And, and that's all it is. And then when you actually get something that maybe looks like that, that you're on the winning side, you know, but should you double down, should you continue uh, to play at the casino, because you, there's always a bigger jackpot that you could be chasing. And th this is the, the biggest problem that sort of hypergamy has, uh, and that the female opportunistic sexual strategy has. And so there is this, in, in, in an ideological sense, there is a way in which you can try to fix the house so that the free drinks that women, that some women at least can expect, that 
maybe there's there's an impetus that that can be socialized that somehow you can guarantee that all women will always have free drinks or something like that i, I think that's generally the um that's the aim of feminism you know is that uh the idea that by controlling social conventions you can make things go your way and this is the natural sort of role that women need to play and that they need to reclaim from their systemic oppression that by controlling the context you can control the outcome um, that it's possible to kind of install something in which uh, female privilege no longer becomes a biological window but it becomes a kind of inbuilt into society I, I think that's generally it's something like the dream of this new version of feminism. Um, which is essentially also built on the idea that men and women cannot be reconciled in some sense. That essentially that they are different, radically different. Um, you know, it, it, it's so hard to rationalize the ideological worldview because it, it's so... It's so contradictory and and it and it's so self-deluded you know because you know it, it's it's like phrases like separate but equal you know it, it's just nonsense at the end of the day it just becomes semantic window dressing to force people to bend the knee essentially um and to pay homage to 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 the ideology being uh preeminent okay so I, I skated around some some sort of very troubling rabbit holes and and tangents but um At some point, there is a um, a window in which authenticity, you know, is going to come back into the cultural light. It's going to be, you know, I mean, I'm imagining people in high schools. At some point, the culture is going to seem enough of a failure, enough of a doomed experiment, that it's going to be worthy of being rebelled against and a new kind of authenticity a new kind of um uh genuine sense of of um cultural compromise uh, is going to be negotiated between boys and girls uh in schools you know um It is slightly worrying because um, I mean, in the meantime, we have essentially generations, um, a generation that's sort of 15 years w wide that I, I think might just be essentially for the most part irredeemable, that, that, that they have been programmed with this kind of simplistic narrative sanctimoniousness, this this reality tunnel, being able to essentially assert ideological facts to supplement for uh, reality, which doesn't give them the soapbox to sanctimoniously dictate their whims from, and to demand the self-esteem which they feel deprived by the system. And, and that they will find some scapegoat in order to parasitically extract uh, the sense of their failed self-confidence. Um, they'll have to find someone to bring down ritualistically in order to feed this kind of this sort of vampire narrative. Um, you know, it, it's going to this generation 
hopefully they will be such a failed generation that they will stand up as an example for everyone else to kind of to openly scorn as being you know sort of self-deluded and um and essentially uh almost the embodiment of everything that that is um you know moral scum essentially uh you know people that if they did have children if they were capable of being practical enough to actually have children would essentially produce a generation of mindless fascistic um indoctrinate because you know people that would have to have superficial values people that need moral pictures because they can't actually uh, have normative values the people that judge on on superficial uh you know people's whose morality is, is extracted from from superficial features um you know and, and who who call their special form of prejudice uh anti-racism or or whatever you know simply because they don't know what morality looks like they think that well you have a moral picture and then the means can justify the ends and then you just need to be on on the right side of the mob essentially um people who can't honestly deal with ideas uh they can only argue about the form that things take uh in the same way that borderline women will argue about some superficial feature which they pretend they have been naively duped by so that they can force someone to take responsibility for some outcome that they can sort of impute onto them you know this weird kind of parasitic codependency um But yeah, it, it certainly is um, scary, you know, just how much they got their voice into journalism and into media. Just how much they've normalized this form of, of anti-normative hyper-realism that is based on sort of the most blind and ignorant form of prejudice, you know, and cherry-picked lies, lies, and statistics, that it's all this... Um, anything that confirms the the reality tunnel that they've taken society down into and i mean the, the people who i think um are somewhat a bit larger than life that exemplify this on a societal level i mean are people like milo i think milo really was the canary in the coal mine he was this kind of male jerk he was that's exactly what he was trying to exemplify because this is let's say the cultural diagnosis as to what is missing um there were some things that i said which i'd like to go over again because they could have been said in, in a broader way um That this latest wave of feminism dehumanized men and then it placed its blanket accusation against men as sort of the gatekeeper to sexuality. And essentially created this, this perverse incentive this is a bit implicit this is a bit hidden but essentially so it created this dicta that you have to say something about the blanket accusation in order to gain access to sexuality or, or something like that um in order to have your it, it really politicized sexuality in in a very strange way 
that you have to adhere to certain dicta, you have to adhere to certain ideological facts. And then the implicit thing there is that then there is a perverse incentive to double that down into more general and vague and remote abstract narrative conceptualizations of systemic oppression to try to sort of take the emphasis off of sexuality and put the emphasis onto something else simultaneously so that you can kind of maybe gain some kind of reprieve or you can deleverage all this ideological pressure that's placed on sexuality um, that you can kind of uh, spread the focus of the ideological gate gatekeeping on sexuality so you can kind of give it something else to produce dicta about give it something else to sort of explore and to pontificate into you know strange codes of conduct and strange ways of interpreting reality um, to, to kind of deleverage all the ideological escalation around sexuality. But it's never really let go of sexuality, and I think that that is essentially the linchpin of the whole mess. Um, and women know that essentially that that is the, the bulwark of their cultural power, uh, which now has this this weird kind of cultural and political power. So it's this weird kind of con conglomeration of these things. And as moral authority has been snowballed into that complex, um, normative values and actual morality and actual common sense have just essentially been bulldozed, you know, steamrolled. Uh, um, they've just kind of disintegrated um, in the face of that kind of cultural power. Um, and no one is willing to contest it on those grounds. I will say no one except for people like Milo, who was essentially, I mean, and I think that he, he roughly articulated this, perhaps not as directly as I'm articulating it now, but he, he roughly sketched out this proposition, uh, at least in an actualized form in, you know, in terms of his, um, participation in the cultural war, um, I think there is also, because when your morality is grounded in a moral picture and not in normative values, I think there is a natural tendency to try to find some kind of almost ritual to employ yourself with in order to prove that you have some kind of connection to the moral picture, that, that there is some that you're on the right side of representing the the goodness in the in driving towards the the moral outcome or something like that at developing th that picture um into reality and so i i think there is this this tendency to to try to find something like a witch hunt um or to get on some kind of bandwagon to know that you're on the right side of the moral picture, essentially. Um, and I, I think that generally this is why journalism has been so corrupted. Um, and the kind of the hyper-realism that comes out of that, it, it's because it comes from essentially a hollow ethical paradigm that requires somehow to extract an ought from an is. And to line up its loose associative thinking with some local current event with with the moral picture that is meant to be the kind of um, the overlay of how we're supposed to judge things. And I mean, it's, it's interesting, I, I think that the media in general that has been radicalized through identity politics now, 
does not know how to interrogate reality. Um, it, it only knows how to compare things to a moral picture, essentially. Um, it's interesting, but I mean, uh, I mean, you can't expect everyone to have experience like this, but I mean, if you've ever had to tolerate watching someone who has borderline personality disorder um, going through the motions of throwing reality under the bus and sort of reconceiving recent history and selectively remembering things and decontextualizing reality in order to conform to their um, projection of themselves as an innocent, naive victim uh, that, that has been misled and, and why anything that they have done wrong and why they haven't arrived at, at their positive outcome is because they've, they've been inducted to go the wrong way by somebody else who must take responsibility for their outcome. It's, um, you know, it, it's almost like the, the one is a, is a macrocosmic ideological, uh, situation of of what happens in a microcosm if you have the misfortune uh to to be related or, or, or to know uh someone with borderline personality disorder um as you you always feel this kind of this this dramatic narrative vortex of how issues are projected onto you as you become this kind of unwitting host and audience to an unraveling um, or a, 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 the, their direction of of the of the unfolding of the plot uh, and you know sort of in some sense they usually extract a kind of complicity because at some point, uh, it's too much for them to keep track of all the details. So they will abject, abjectly sort of create uh, summaries and generalizations that are supposed to be close enough that you just have to kind of accept it. That it, it doesn't matter that their story doesn't add up in the slightest. It's that, well the theme of the story is something that you should be sympathetic to. It's something that your sympathy should compel you to accept. And then I would say the, co the correlation of that in the ideological narrative is that you, you just have to accept that they're going to cherry pick their statistics. You just have to accept that they're going to take specious perspectives on reality uh, and, and use them to, to cobble together a kind of um, an argument and a case. Um, as to why their emergency, why their moral panic has to be uh, conceded to, why their demands must be seen as the expedient and necessary step to alleviate some kind of um, emergency, which is often uh, concocted by their own mismanagement and maladministration and dishonesty. Um, and their own dislocation from actually dealing with reality. Um, because somehow they're above that. They are just these pure moral entities that are extolling a moral narrative. And it doesn't matter that reality doesn't conform to their moral narrative. They'll make it fit. And they'll make you put up with the inconsistency. Somehow you just have to kind of... You have to be busy with making it fit. You have to be busy with like somehow translating the moral narrative into pandering to the right victim or whatever, pandering the correct sympathy by sort of swallowing the fact that their narrative just doesn't conform, is completely incoherent, is self-contradictory. Uh, there's no place for it in reality, but somehow you just have to swallow that. Um, this is this is how a fascist culture operates. This is how a fascist ethos and a totalitarian, you know, sort of groupthink um, perpetrates itself. Uh, and, you know, usually it gets away with it because it can just keep on despoiling 
grammar. It just keeps on redefining words. It keeps on making up new vocabulary and new definitions of old words. Um, so, so that their story is always correct because the meaning of the words will change in order to keep it correct. Um, yeah, this is essentially, I mean, I, I believe that this is repurposed borderline personality disorder. Uh, and in, 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 in another way as well, uh, that's what fascist ideology always was. Um, Hitler probably modeled it after some female caregiver, uh, his aunt or his mother or something, uh, whoever raised him. And as, as their language has sort of taken over more territory within the culture and, and they've normalized uh, what is essentially an anti-normative uh, ethical framework, yeah, it's... Uh, it's scary. When people as sort of immature and, and morally vacuous as this get their hands on the levers of power, on any kind of institutional power, uh, because they completely destroy any kind of sense of fair procedure, just gets railroaded, you get steamrolled by the ideological imperatives um, for sympathizing with the right uh, section of the population or, or something as arbitrary as that. It's um, justice is no longer wearing a blindfold. Uh, justice becomes a racist. Uh, and this form of racism is just relabeled anti-racism. Um, Oh my, I forgot the point that I wanted to expand on, but now I've remembered it. Um, so uh, I, I want to go back to the things that I could have mentioned um, and espoused in a, in a much broader sense when I was talking about conspiracy theories being a... I mean, in some sense, I, I, I did put a positive spin on that. Oh, yes, it's good to have conspiracy theories because... Um, in some sense, it will facilitate the establishment of a new sense-making organ within culture, a new sense-making apparatus that, you know, will, will displace the conspiracy theories. And the reason why we don't have something yet that displaces uh, the conspiracy theories is because we don't yet have that sense-making apparatus. And so to have conspicuous people touting conspiracy theories is also positive in the more general sense or, or good in the more general sense because it is a blatant slap in the face as it were to the current mainstream media um, that they are untrusted that, that they cannot be trusted to gatekeep what is uh, regarded as as uh, uh, credible and so that's another sort of general symptom, uh, which I would say is a positive byproduct of the fact. And so the idea that we're just going to crack down on conspiracy theories and we're going to stop people from believing in, in things that are factually reported to them by people uh, 
um, or, or, or that would be factually imposed as an orthodoxy from a source that is generally undeserving of trust, like the mainstream media, uh, who has become, you know, completely captured by this. I mean, I, I think in some sense that um, this is what happens when your media establishment, uh, I mean, okay, I mean, I'm going to put my own spin on this, this, this might not be obvious or something like that, but I would say that w when you've got an ideologically driven sort of activist type of, of journalism, of, of so, journalism and in inverted commas, that, that doesn't have a normative value system, a normative morality that has any kind of principles um, articulating it, when it's just the means justify the ends towards some moral picture uh, that has come to displace normative morality. Um, in, in my view, the mainstream is indistinguishable from any other kind of conspiracy theory cult think. You know, it, 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 it has essentially lowered its standards to be as to be essentially a, a particular variant of another conspiracy theory. It's the conspiracy theory of systemic oppression. It's the con it, it, it it's the same kind of narrative. It's the same kind of worldview as any of the other sort of weird kind of conspiracy theories that people cling to because uh, they it becomes a simplistic an abject sort of knee-jerk response in order to make the, wor the world easily readable and, and palpable to, to your sort of simplistic sentimentality. You know, it, it, it makes the world accessible to your emotions in some sense. Um, you know, it, it, it leans into cognitive dissonance, and there is a lot of cognitive dissonance in the anti-normative, you know, um, worldview uh, that is being pushed by the mainstream media. So, yeah, I mean, uh, that people are going to say, oh, no, no, but, but freedom of speech should not be freedom of reach. And so if people are plugging conspiracy theories, then, then they need to be cracked down on, th that we need some kind of big brother tech censorship in order to uh, corral the sheeple back towards the mainstream media because there'll be no alternative um, and there'll be no organic sort of cultural um, emergence of, of, of something else that can actually mark itself as being different from the style of blind faith and sort of simplistic narrative peddling, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I, I would say that, you know, complaining about, um, I mean, this is why I find Sasha Baron Cohen's um, rant so disgustingly ironic and so hideously hi hypocritical is because what he is peddling in his emotional ranting is, you know, this the same anti-normative worldview. I'm not going to give you the principle as to why we should do what I'm telling, what I'm encouraging Facebook to do, but we just need censorship because we must just say that this is wrong. So let's just fudge. Like I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what the actual normative thing. He says, I know that it's hard, but we must just regard this as wrong, and so it must be. We must put a stop to it. It must just happen. You know, it it it, it has no value system. There's there's no system of of ethics or morality there. Uh, and then he and then he uses the Holocaust and and he uses, you know, I mean, to create a moral panic to force people to have to to take his sentiment and to take it forward and to double down on it. Um, you know, it, it's 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 ridiculous, um, and ironically, it has created exactly that which is almost the antithesis to Western values and, and, and to um, public discourse, all under the, the, the Orwellian newspeak of freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. Uh, this is something that cannot be thought. You cannot say the phrase freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. You, you cannot say that. If you say that, you 
what is your objective standard? What, wh where are you going to install the social engineering that's going to keep an eye on what freedom of speech needs to be ad hoc curtailed from its freedom of reach? Um, I mean, I, I would almost say have absolutely no censorship, but put whatever disclaimers you want to uh, that are coming from your platform. Put as many disclaimers as you want, but don't, don't actually take something down. Don't, don't stop it. And not unless it's directly breaking the law in terms of inciting people to violence or, you know, like some kind of illegal or illicit pornography or, or something like that. Or it, it, it was something that breaks some kind of uh, general across the board rule that actually doesn't have anything to do with political opinion. Uh, you know, th that is something to do with, with um, I mean, pornography is, is the best sort of thing that I can imagine where, you know, uh, fine, if, if you want to have a platform that, that has restrictions on pornography that, that doesn't seem like it's a, that's not a political um, issue as, as, as far as I'm concerned. And, and, that, and then at least you're enforcing that rule across the board evenly. Um, but this kind of shadow banning and uh, shadow censorship um, where you're just, uh, where, where you've got essentially things that actually strangle the algorithm and the idea that you're doing that so that you're stopping people from from race to the bottom of the of the brain stem i mean really that that's that's not seriously what's happening i mean you you you're you're not stopping you're not using censorship in order to stop the race to the bottom of the, of, of the brainstem. That's not what's happening. So, so let's not even pretend that these people have got such lofty public health conscious uh, uh, agendas that they're trying to uh, um, perpetrate by selectively enforcing their own fudged ethical standards where, well, in South Africa... Um, because there's some kind of woman's day or something like that, then kill all men, that gets a free pass. That hashtag on Twitter uh, gets a free pass. You know, it, it's crazy. I mean, it's literally, it's so hypocritical. It's so pathetic. It's so morally bankrupt. And they're going to tell us that, that somehow, uh, that they can do public morality, that, that, they, that they can shape thought control and that, and that they are somehow responsible adults and everyone else is just a kind of infant uh, that can't deal with reality if it's not being filtered and, and uh, meted out by their, uh, somehow, the, the, their right to choose for everyone else. So this is my point. Is when, you, when you say such hideous things as freedom of speech is not freedom of reach, you are literally saying... Uh, someone must automatically choose for the rest of us. Uh, you're inventing a role for someone to to play that Orwellian uh, uh, 19, or I was going to say, the, the Huxleyan world controller is now in the picture. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's crazy. Um, now we're going to have these these ideologically agenda driven world controllers. I mean, it's uh, and the disgusting thing is is that what Sasha Baron Cohen was trying to um, was trying to to advocate for should be illegal. That kind of socially engineering. You know, uh, I mean, this is this is dangerous stuff. This is so dangerous that it sh it really should be illegal. People that perpetrate this kind of thought control over platforms, which are supposed to be the the substance on platforms, is supposed to be populated by free agents, by people with their own agency and their own consciousness, uh, and their and their own consciences. Uh, uh, 
you know, doing as they will and and developing as they will without some kind of um, socially engineering, you know, going on in the, in the background. I mean, it's... Um, I mean, if, if we're going to say, is, see that platforms are going to be doing this kind of stuff, I think, I mean, um, there must be some kind of antitrust mechanism to at least decentralize, because I mean, right now, what's even worse is that these big tech platforms have inherited their monopoly. They didn't start off doing this kind of Orwellian um, world controller brave new world, you know, kind of thought control. They didn't start off doing that, right? But now they have started doing it. And when they started doing it, they inherited a platform that essentially got the biggest, I mean, you know, one of the biggest pulls towards any kind of tech platform is that people already belong to it. It already has all your friends on it that you can connect to through it. So the incumbent monopoly that they have inherited in order to perpetrate this kind of thought control. I think, I, I think that antitrust needs at least if it, if, if, if this can't, if there isn't a mechanism within anti antitrust already, I mean, now we really have to, um, expand antitrust. I mean, I mean, this is what, um, left, left-leaning people have been warning us about, you know, that uh, when you have monopolies, when you have monopolies, there is a danger. And when you have a, a monopoly over what people see, you know, in, in terms of what gets populated on their screens, when it's no longer up to them, I mean, that this was the brilliance of the internet, was that it was decentralized. And now they are trying to colonize it, essentially, in, in the name of these big tech oligarchs. It's disgusting. It's hideous. Um, it needs it needs to be politically, uh, I would say, stepped in on uh, at this point. Um, I, I'm, I think antitrust sh should be expanded um, in order to cover this kind of uh, dark and un. I mean, this is a danger which is so hidden. You know, I mean, this is an evil which is so great. Um, we need to find a way to secure Western values. Um, it, it, it's, it's a, a bit funny. I mean, there's this general theme that everyone hoped that China, as it became more prosperous, um, and I mean, there's a still a version of this argument, which is still true, which is that the more China becomes a middle income country, the more the fact that it's run by um, a central control, which has to have its uh, fingers in the economy in order to keep its political hegemony intact. Uh, and the more that that political hegemony um, is going to be a, a stifling effect on having an advanced economic, um, sophisticated, uh, developmental. It's it's hard to not be a middle income country. You have to have proper institutions that have real integrity. You need to develop your legal system so that sophisticated contracts are enforceable. Because if you don't get that kind of nuance, if you don't get that level of sophistication, you just can't develop past a certain level you, you need and and if your judiciary is also as essentially corrupt as you, as your public sector um which is having this corrupting influence over uh stifling your private sector because essentially big state owned monopolies or state run monopolies um just treat the the, the, the entrepreneurs, the private entrepreneurs just kind of get steamrolled. I mean, they get treated very badly. And, and the law itself is just a kind of gelatinous mass to be remolded by, you know, in, in whatever the state power wants. So you end up actually stifling yourself because the real innovators um, are trodden on 
uh, in a way that where the rule of law itself is is even you know is in a tattered state, is in a questionable state. And so you know the idea was is that if you if you if you accelerated China up to this point, then suddenly the extent to which that the Communist Party itself became um, the apparent obstacle to future development would would essentially and and the, you would hope that you would have an enlightened leadership within China that was capable of um, changing its form of politics. But the problem is is that because they haven't had democracy for so long, and because let's say public morality is sort of affixed into this infantilized sort of you know that that essentially the the communist party is delivering sanctity and safety and integrity to you know the kind of the ethnic chinese identity is being exalted through the political power and and so you've got this kind of this corrupt compact where it's a it's a form of identity politics in some sense um where under the guise that the political leadership is looking out for the identitarian ethnic interests, um, then the ends justify the means and they don't have to deal, they don't have to be transparent. And so, you know, you get, you get like a mafia style corruption that takes place. Uh, because even, even if, if that's the vision, the moral vision is that, well, you're doing it for the greatness of the, of the collective identity. And so you can't, you know, even if you're going to be a little bit corrupt, you're not going to betray your allegiance to the collective identity because that's the kind of, that's the window dressing that keeps the show always moving forward and, 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 and continuing. Um, you know, it, it's, it's hollow propaganda that never gets tested because the only way that you would test it would be um you know competitive elections in some sense or or some kind of um renewal of um of a mandate and and some kind of uh, oversight that the population has now obviously you know um because of differentials in power, you know, even places that have a democracy, you have this kind of plutocratic decadence in the West uh, that, that, I mean, I think we're coming out of it. I, I think there is a bit of a renewal and a return to real politics because, you know, the idea is, is that elites and plutocrats, they have the money essentially to get fake experts to sell snake oil to the states, which provides them a cover to continue their plutocracy, to continue their decadent extraction from the states, um, and 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 help them protect their monopolies. Where all you really need to do to have an effective functioning country is you need to have elite, uh, or you um, you need to have intellectual elites. You need to have experts who are actually willing to render their expertise to the citizen, you know, and, and, and if you think about it, it shouldn't be that hard to do, you know, because essentially through the state, the state should have the resources to buy expertise to actually offer them, you know, uh, proper expert opinion and expert, um, you know, uh, uh, You know, why shouldn't the state have have the most sort of expertise in fueling its decisions? Why, why should, you know, the financial sector have essentially everything warping towards its, um, you know, it, it anyway. Uh, I mean, the answer to that is, is, a, is simply... Um, I mean, it's a form of corruption, um, and ostensibly this corruption is kind of it happened. Uh, every society is prone to this. I mean, I would say China is prone to this. It's just that it's more easily covered over when you have a kind of identitarian sort of ethno nationalism um, 
it's easier to conceal, it's easier to disguise under that propaganda. Um, at least in the West, you can see that there is tension around it. It's being, it's being um, transparently, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it has the possibility of, of being expunged, um, of, of being exposed. Uh, obviously, it doesn't help when journalism itself has, has sort of so largely discredited itself uh, and is so prone to just kind of um, sort of being associated where from wherever their paycheck is coming from, you know, sort of independent journalism is what we now have access to for the first time because of essentially the internet. And under that new organizing principle, I think we have a hope of um, actually, you know, having a real democracy, as it were, if we can just sort of overcome this this last hurdle, which is essentially um, unscrupulous sort of big tech censorship, as it were. Um, it's, it's ironic how there's, there's always this, you know, uh, it's, it's been described by a lot of people that, you know, you have the people right at the top of society often creating a false consciousness of, of, of revolutionary ideology which is essentially used to reinforce the power of the people at the top and, and usually used to kind of um, bully around the middle of society. Um, and to kind of milk them and, and, and to extract from them. And, and essentially the revolutionaries always think, well, they're going to become, you know, you know, when their revolution takes root, then somehow they're, uh, they're going to be elevated, uh, you know, they're going to join the ranks of the nomenclatura. Um, they're going to be part of this new sort of revolutionary aristocracy. That's always, you know, the kind of, uh, the political elevation, as it were. Um, and and is always at the cost of, of sort of the whole potential and opportunity of the system will we'll then have to put up with this, you know, almost a renewal of parasitism as it just kind of takes on a new virtue signaling, you know, sort of narrative. Um, but it's the same sort of system of, of exploitation. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I do think that that's sort of... Um, where we sit at the moment. But essentially the, the reason for me bringing up China is that it's just it's slightly ironic that people hoped that China would move its kind of political vision more towards the, the, the libertarian, uh, you know, um, Western version but instead, the, the, the libertarian values of the West have sort of have been overturned by this ideological poison, which is essentially the same as China, um, which is ideologically uh, very much the same kind of consciousness. I mean, obviously, it doesn't look quite the same because China is, um, or at least the, the, the mythology around the Chinese identity is that it's a homogenous uh, um, that everyone has the same sort of Chinese identity uh, in China. And, um, but essentially, it has, it has the same sort of worldview in it. Um, at least as to do at least relative to, to the constituency of, you know, sort of uh, how humans need to be judged through the, the identity matrix or whatever, um, and how that needs to sort of filter your, your political interface with things, that people need a political representation for their identity, um, and that there's nothing wrong with having your interests uh, 
being politically represented via an identitarian um, and 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 that is you know essentially th through through when those are your major priorities then you know uh, a lot of things fall by the wayside you know sort of c civil liberties become unimportant um, because essentially people become their identitarian makeup more so than being individuals with agency um, you know it, they get completely denigrated um, By their own narrative, I, you know, it, it, it's it's one of these things. That, I mean, there's there's essentially been this huge regression, um, sort of in in Western morality, which is very dangerous because I mean we've lost the biggest ideological tool that we could have had in terms of helping other countries uh, find themselves on a better path. Because you know, even if you want to say, well look, we've always had elites running the show and we've always had corruption, at least in the Western frame of things, with Western institutions, uh, you had a real hope about doing something about it, about uh, having autonomy, or having enough autonomy that it was you were capable of stopping things from gener degenerate, degenerating below a certain point um, of destabilization. Um, people really don't understand how special what uh, the West really is, um, you know, and 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 it's. I, I think it, it dawns on people because we see it being eclipsed at the moment. We see it sort of. Um, We see the sun going down, and you know it's um, it's such a dehumanizing way of of. Um, To, to not have any kind of normative value system or, or ethics uh, to have that replaced uh, with, with such a superficial and prejudiced you know world view um, in which it's not possible to have a common decent society anymore you would have to have some degree of segregation um, I've, I've tried to describe this that it's, it's not necessarily segregation but they either require people to have such ideological such stringent ideological um, attestation to the same dicta or, or they all have to repeat the narrative verbatim so perfectly so you know with their ducks in a row uh it has to be so stringently that you that you know that you all believe in the same narrative, and if you can't perform that, then you have to segregate, because otherwise you're going to infringe on e on each other's safe space. You, you you you're going to represent to them how their identity still bears the mark of some kind of systemic oppression, and you're not going to stop representing these things to people. It's it's you know because. It, the, the, the narrative is so all-consuming, it's so self-deluded that essentially you, you, you adopt this moral narrative so then you don't have to actually function in reality. You don't have to uh, deal with issues because you can instead just use a kind of ideological scapegoat to extract all the self-esteem that you feel that you deserve because one identity has, has a nicer, has something better about it.
than your identity. So, you know, you just, you focus in on that. You focus in on that strange, reductive, hyper-real sort of projection onto people. I mean, this is, this is the racist imagination. This is how all racism works, by projecting generalizations onto people. And there is nothing holding them back from doing that. There's nothing in identity consciousness that tells people to put a lid on that. You know, it, it's, uh, it's indulged as a form of, of self-soothing even. It's, um, you know, and, and so it's, it's going to breed a form of vile racist, um, you know, where, where people are being field marshals for their own identity. I mean, you, you know, you already see the Fuhrer principle, but I mean, anyway, I mean, when you look at all this stuff, you know, it's so anti-Western, it's so disgusting and hollow, you know, it's so anti-liberal, you know, it's, um, it's so regressive. It's such a nightmare. It's, um, it really does, uh, uh, You know, it, it, it's horrifying to live through. Um, you know, you can only feel that, that, that this is what it must have felt like in Weimar, Germany. Um, watching the morality get twisted and warped in this way. And then, you know, hideous irony is that whenever anyone makes any comparison between, um, you know, the, the Nazi philosophy um, and these people, they say, oh, this is offensive to me because of the Holocaust and because people died in the Holocaust. And you're talking about ideology. You know, it's, um, it's a bit, uh, I mean, th that, that, I mean, you know, it, it's, scary how things have been weaponized and, and how um, you know how, how how much substance gets removed from superficial forms uh, which then are taken to be sort of symbolic of of moral facts uh, is just so ironic, I guess, you know, that particular example. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's particularly disgusting where I live in my country because, you know, we had a, a democratic revolution, we had a constitution that had real values in it, a real normative morality, and just how quickly people will betray real values because they can join a mob, because they can join a racist mob, and they can have their disgusting sentiments empowered and and they can freely indulge in their toxic resentments and you know weird kind of projections which allow them to uh, empower their their strange form of racial pride uh, as if that is the thing that's going to save the day um, 
Yeah, I mean, especially also, I mean, this has made sort of making inroads into modernizing the Islamic world uh, much, much harder. You know, it's, it's set back feminism, like first wave feminism in the, in, in the Islamic world now, I think, is, is, is going to be impossible for at least another 70 years. And that's, that's projecting that we can get uh, the West can get its house in order and somehow put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, I think it'll take at least 50 years after that. This schism will have to be very well digested and understood. The schism within the West um, that precipitated this vile, toxic um, subversion of Western values. Um, and, 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 and liberal values. And you just see the kinds of people that opportunistically chased after this toxic movement. Um, I mean, it, it, it's a slight, I mean, in some sense, I think it shows the breadth of the human, the problem in the human condition. That, you know, we have moral midgets all over the place. We have vacuous people who are just looking for an excuse to essentially indulge in their in essentially their sentiment, their sort of, I want to say, fascistic sentimentality, that, that, they, that they just want to have a moral picture so then they can ritualistically take out their hypocrisy on some scapegoat. Uh, There's a very good um, lecture from a round table, uh, I think held by the Nexus Institute, and um, it's embarrassing that I can't remember all the names of the philosophers, but Roger Scruton was one of them. And there's a clip from that, which uh, is actually better to watch that clip and not to watch it in context, because they had many questions, and this question was, was actually edited as well to cut off the end because it kind of goes off the rails after a certain point, but um, f f from one of the people answering the questions. But in, within that clip, it's perfect. And uh, it, if you just look up on modernity, uh, you can find that clip. And that philosophically, I think, is... Um, People just can't put up with their own sense of um, responsibility for their own uh, choices, essentially. And so they would rather double down and, and find a scapegoat and find a convenient ideological narrative that, uh, that facilitates them doubling down and externalizing blame. And it, yeah, and that just so happens to be more of a feminine trope than it is a male trope. Um, and, and that probably has something to do with borderline personality disorder as being largely connotated to femininity uh, and, and to a feminine way of engaging and participating. Um, and this might be something of a property of the fact that we just live in a very low level of integrated culture, you know, that the, the, the actual level at which culture functions is just 
relatively, you know, kind of, it's tending towards the lowest common denominator. And so uh, it's very easy for anyone to kind of work out a general strategy, especially one that conforms to strategies that other people are already using and have sort of enculturated people into having to condone and tolerate that then women as a block can essentially use this borderline interface as a kind of, as a valence, as, as a role that they can play. And they've sort of attached it to their, uh, when I say sexuality, uh, I, I don't mean that it's, um, In the same way that people can incorporate their sexuality into other aspects of their life, into other aspects of how they have a, um, a, holi a holistic sort of social identity uh, and, and, and how they incorporate uh, their sexuality into a holistic social role for themselves and a, and a cultural identity. Um, that they have been able to use this borderline way of uh, interfacing and relating to things to kind of um, to conveniently sort of perpetrate uh, forms of, of sort of social manipulation, which often takes, takes the form of, of a kind of selective passivity, a kind of uh, you know, sort of selective adherence to rules, you know, where you can kind of use the system um, to say that, no, you were actually misled by someone who gave you the wrong impression, therefore they need to be on the hook for delivering to you the outcome that you expected to receive, you know, that it's always... Uh, sort of projecting accountability onto somebody else. And in some, in some way, feminism is, is uh, this latest variant of feminism is the, is the collection of that, which is that the collective misled me the collective is oppressing me uh the systemic patriarchy um has uh deprived me of the outcome that i deserve and therefore i must just be granted it it must just be bestowed upon me my my identity uh And as soon as you interface with reality on that kind of autistic, solipsistic, internal narrative, you know, then all you need to do is, is be able to interpret things. You don't have to participate. You don't have to engage. You can just reflexively just go into a kind of interpretive solipsism and you just dictate the narrative as you see it. And then everyone else has to comply with the direction that you are imputing and projecting uh, by telling your truth and telling your narrative so there's no there's no reality other than essentially this crude specious contextualization of reality um, as long as what you say sounds plausible in some semantic interpretation and then they're even free to to re re-establish the meaning of words in order to, to fit the truth of the narrative, you know, it's, uh, it's so self-delusional, it's so, anyway, um, I, I think we do have to, at some point, come to terms with why, why does this archetype of the devouring mother exist, uh, and also recognize, uh, as, as Jung 
accurately pointed out that what you resist persists. And who are these people that are resisting the most? And who is the true source of racism and fascism? Where is it coming from? And they, it's ironic because literally everything that they say they are guilty of, you know, the, uh, you know, I, I just Vosh on YouTube, he, he says about Tim Pool, is Tim Pool stupid or dishonest? And I, I think there isn't much of a better way to describe Vorsch's characteristic. It's like stupid or dishonest question mark. Who knows? You know, it's it it's some combination probably. Uh, it's like a perennial question. 